Welcome back, friends, to another episode of the Zephcast, the show where we get to know your favorite content creators, streamers, and podcasters alike. I am your host, Zephyrs XP, and with me today, we got Twitch streamer, mental health advocate, and meme extraordinaire, the one and only Wandering Pilgrim. Thank you so much for being here today, dude. How's your day going so far? It's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure. Uh, well, Logitech Cam software was a uh being dumb so uh other than that though it's been a good day today so how, how you been man i've been doing pretty good just kind of getting a ton of work done soup i've been excited all day to be able to talk to you one-on-one -on -one like this um i've really started to realize like having conversations with friends this way is just a great way to kind of get in each other's heads a little bit kind of um just kind of learn a little bit more about each other kind of put more of character behind the person who appears in chat so uh I've, i'm incredibly excited to deep dive into some really good conversations with you my friend and um usually, that, man. usually we start off with an icebreaker question so you think you're ready for it sure thing all right so they're always randomized and the one i got this time was if you could instantly become an expert in one thing with the snap of a finger what would you choose and why? Oh, that's a that's a good one. Hmm. Ah, I'm trying to think. If I could instantly become an expert. Um, honestly, just based off of like kind of stuff I've been thinking about lately, quantum physics. Quantum physics. Ooh, nice. Hell yeah. <laughs> why quantum physics over? Because quantum physics is like the physics at a very microscopic scale, right? Yeah, one of the one of the concepts that's kind of often tied with it is uh, Schrodinger's box. Basically, the idea that um, when you if you took a hypothetical box and said that there might be a cat inside, there's a state of there could be no cat inside. There could be a cat that's alive. There could be a cat that's dead. All possibilities exist until you open the box and look inside. And so basically, it's this idea of like reality is what we perceive essentially and that what, as soon as the perceiver looks at reality that's the one they're participating in it kind of ties into like the the multi-verse multi-verse theory well, we're gonna deep dive just right out of the gate i'm already excited for it do you believe in <laughs> um multiverse and, and stuff like that oh just um i don't know i've, I've always found uh science interesting and, and that's one of the things that's kind of uh um, speculated on is like whether like um like there's different universes themselves and like one of the things with multiverse uh one of the thoughts behind it is that like all potential realities could exist and that they would all be their own separate like universes essentially right right or that there could be we could be having this exact same conversation in another universe but like flipped or you could be interviewing me or like there's a million different ways that it could go um i've also heard kind of the theory with multiverse that there could also be other universes out there with a different change in their dynamics in terms of how their their cells are structured and positive protons and and stuff like that so you could actually have some universes completely devoid of life or atoms or anything because certain molecules aren't charged correctly enough to where they can interact with other ones in some way um so yeah it so many what ifs in that and and i mean i wonder if we'll ever be able to figure out any truth to that it would be interesting um the idea part of the idea there kind of diving into what you're saying is also that um you know there might be different um like lost the universe that exists in those different places so it could be something so foreign and alien to us like in, in another potential one that it would be it may even be impossible for us to navigate in just because of how different it is right like if we were to somehow warp to that other universe because of the way physics are in that universe we our cells could just immediately evaporate or whatever <laughs> that's terrifying to think about but i mean in a sense like it's i've thought i've thought a lot about the idea that the world in which we re live in is relative to our size and our being and everything whereas if we were a lot smaller like quantum size it's a completely different world within a world just like the earth is you know a world within a galaxy galaxies a galaxy within the universe it's it's all about perspective right mm -hmm. oh yeah uh, it definitely does help with perspective especially when you see those zoomed out maps and you're like oh well we were, we're a little speck there and now you can't even see our galaxy anymore let alone all the other stuff it's just it's it's pretty wild it's 
um i was talking with uh some friends a couple days ago about the pale blue dots when voyager was leaving the solar system and it turned around after it already passed like pluto and everything turned around and took a photo of earth and it's just such a small little pixel it's it's actually even smaller than the pixel on the sensor and everything I, I think uh it was Carl Sagan was saying like everything you've ever known ever loved anything humanity's ever done anything we've ever built or imagined or dreamed just anything that's ever come of us is on that teeny tiny blue little dot that's smaller than the size of a pixel and it's very yep. like whoa it's it's very mind-blowing to an extent oh yeah definitely awe-inspiring so kind of going a little bit more away from the super big scale of the universe down to a <laughs> little bit more um on your side of things my friend i always gotta ask right out the gate who is wandering pilgrim the streamer and the person behind the streamer well for me at least when it comes to the streamer and the person behind the streamer it's kind of a what you see is what you get kind of thing i uh you know, obviously I enjoy like, you know, memeing it up or like, you know, hamming it up and doing impressions and stuff. There was a, a Bloodborne lore thing we did where I got this Victorian era costume sort of thing and a top hat. That. Yes, yes. And, uh, <laughs> I saw that. and dressed up for that and was trying to like role play around. So like, I like having fun with that. But like, I, I, I'm pretty much a person who's like, you know, is who he is, wears the heart on the sleeve, very just true to myself forever so like when you interact with me on here like if you were interacting with me off stream it'd be the same way pretty much so um that's just that's just how i roll um a uh, big thing with um streaming i i had watched streams for like a while like since like 2013 something like that so i'd, I'd been like lurking in different streams on twitch and stuff for a while and then one of the things that kind of really cemented me like wanting to get into it aside from just like the creative stuff that you can do with it uh, and the fun you can have there was um when i saw uh her name's she snaps she was like primarily a destiny streamer and it's kind of more of like just chatting now but we'll still pop on destiny like destiny 2 every now and then mm -hmm. but she started having these streams where um she would just talk about like you know real heavy topic stuff like um and it was kind of like talking from her own experiences in her life but it kind of like opened up a place for other people to feel comfortable to be able to share about the stuff stuff that was happening in their lives as well and um seeing that and just seeing how helpful that was for other people i was like yeah i kind of want to do something like that so that was a big reason i got into it that's why i um have the the, the focus on like mental health and you know always have the floor open for like discussion on mental health topics and i'm big on like proper education about mental health so i'm actually in school uh to go into being a licensed counselor finish my first year <laughs> so I got two more years to go but uh almost there. um yeah so after that take my license when i get started i can be a licensed counselor so do you have um, a specific like area that you want to go into counseling? Um, like any kind of, I don't know, go like school for account. Are you going like to help uh, students at school for counseling or open up your own like counseling business or have you kind of thought where you want to go with that exactly? Not entirely sure. Um, I got, I was kind of open as to where the different avenues might take me. Uh, I, I tend to be someone who prefers to be his own boss, so that probably is going to play a factor. True that. <laughs> which is especially going to be rough at first because you do have to spend a period of time like under the supervision of somebody because there's a different certification to, that you have to get that you can't get until like six months of that sort of experience. And then once gotcha. you have that, you can apply for it. And that, that, that lets you be able to essentially practice independently as a counselor. Like you, you would still be under like a psychologist, but you essentially mm -hmm. have autonomy when it comes to that. Um, but one thing I have been thinking of while I've been in school, um, was going into counseling that would be geared towards kids, um, because there, so there's some kids that go through some really messed up stuff and yeah. the sooner they can get the help they need and the resources to, to help them out, the less impact the trauma will have on their life long term. And so I feel like that's the reason that makes it important for me to like that, that kind of draws me towards wanting to get in younger like that kind of a thing as opposed to having them grow up and have the the fallout of the trauma like 
you know, really hit them and then kind of spill into their adult life and stuff like it'll still affect them even if they get the resources and the help, but they'll have the stuff to make them much more likely to succeed as much as you can as far as that, you know, term is concerned. Because, I mean, if you go through some pretty messed up stuff, it's going to affect you long term no matter what. But you can minimize the impact it has on you. Kind of just like the sooner you get help, the hopefully the easier the situation will be and the easier they can get out of it. Or at least yeah, learn from yeah, it. that's kind of the idea, and and it, it, it's kind of like not feeling lost so much, I guess, just kind of like floundering around, not knowing what to do or where to go with stuff. It gives them like a, a sense of direction on on what to do, because uh, I can remember even when I was younger, like uh, as I was in high school and stuff, I was I was looking back, it's very obvious I was going through like depression and you know like anxiety disorders and i didn't know what was going on with me and so it made it a million times worse not knowing what the hell is happening to me um so just taking even that kind of a basic example if i could help a kid even just be able to know hey this is what this looks like this is what this is just that can be super helpful and make a big difference so it almost feels like there's such a like a line of of I don't know, because at least I think when I was, you know, thinking back when I was a kid, there was a lot of opportunities I had to talk to, like a counselor, to talk to somebody who was an expert on things mental health related. And I just, I don't know, I know myself and I know others kind of struggled with a little bit of that teenage ego, you know, where you're like, no, I'm not going to talk to a counselor. I got this. I got this on my own. But yeah, that's you're 100 percent right in the sense that, you know, people need to understand that there are people there for them to help them you know as kids as young adults um and through every facet of life like just having somebody there reaching their hand out they might not grab it right away but when they do grab it they'll be ready you know and you and you need to have that reached out and just try to help them as soon as you possibly can yeah 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 um there's a lot of things at least in the i mean i, I don't know too much about like all around the world but i know like here in north america specifically we're definitely going through a, a huge mental health crisis in the country for a myriad of different situations and things that are fueled by the opioid pandemic things that are fueled by drugs things that are fueled by addiction and and prison and you know the economics of our country and how it's structured so you know the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer and there's just so many things pressing down on people to push them into places to look for substance substance abuse or you know put them in a position where they really do struggle and it's a uh, it's a tough time it's a tough time to um i don't know it's just a tough time in general you know and it's you try to not be that person to dive too much into a addiction or substance abuse or anything like that and it can definitely be tough i mean at least speaking for myself um I feel like as I've gotten older, that's something mental health wise I've learned about myself is uh, substance abuse is something that can very easily go from a, a celebratory kind of situation into a uh, an every night kind of situation. And yeah, I think just having somebody there to reach their hand out to help can go so, so far in life. So yeah, I, I love hearing that. Um, yeah. What originally got you interested in wanting to start streaming on Twitch? Was it that particular event with that particular, um, it, it was two shoes, right? Uh, she snaps. She snaps. Because she was a photographer. So that's, that's, that's why she had the name of shit. Right. Um, that was kind of yeah, like that was the, kind of the catalyst. Um, uh, I mean, I'd also seen people like Lobos Jr. and stuff do like charity, like right, you streaming for raising charity, uh, funds for charity and stuff like that. So that, that was another thing, but that seeing that stream that she snaps did that was really kind of the catalyst um that kind of pushed it for me yeah was it just getting set up on like a playstation or kind of getting your computer set up or was there kind of a period of like looking for items to kind of get ready for streaming or did you just like throw the laptop up and obs oh. and you're ready to go oh no i wish i would have been more like that but oh no um no i i had actually i had 
picked up a, a computer back in like well 2013 20, i think it was like tail end 2013 it was right around when like dark souls 2 came out or something like that it was like a little bit before but um because i was wanting to do pc gaming because there's someone else who i had seen who was talking about like you know custom pcs and was going through like oh it's not really as bad as as you think necessarily you just got to know what to look for right and um just it was it was to mess around with skyrim on pc of all things like the mods and stuff yes <laughs> that kind of got me to get that equipment but um no i i could have actually probably started streaming like years ago but i just i let the combination of like fear of failure and like perfectionism and like oh it doesn't have this thing just right or all this so i just I ended up not doing the thing that i really wanted to do for a while and it all kind of built up and um for a while and then uh, I started doing some streaming in 2017, but it wasn't really regular until about 2018. Um, so, yeah. Man, that <laughs> that that fear of failure is so powerful, and is just it, I. You wonder just how many people that eats at about at, about so many different things in life is like I want to do something, but I'm scared of failing, or I'm scared of, you know, you people go into it just already failing in their mind, and yeah, it, it seems like a lot of things. I mean, even in my life that I've really wanted to do, they've almost been like piles up of, they get to a point and then there's a breaking point. It's like, screw this. I'm just going to do it. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm just going to go out there and have fun. And yeah, you have to just have that, like, screw this attitude and, and just go for it. The dams have to Pretty burst much. open, right? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, that's basically what happened. Uh, I, I, I finally culminated enough to where it was like, look, if I don't do this now, it's never going to happen. Just just do it. And um, it, it sucks, too, because like you can learn these lessons, but then old patterns can be so hard to break that they can just creep back in and you don't realize it. And and, and then you you give into like the oh, I'm going to be afraid of this. And like I was just thinking about something today. I forget what it was off the top of my head exactly. But um I was I was kind of like walking myself through the, the thing and listening to it. It's like, well, this just sounds silly to like let let fear stop me because of, of this thing. But like, why, why, why would I do that? And it, it, it's just it's so frustrating when it's like, I know I know better, but I still do it. <laughs> right, right. It's it's something that's so human. Just that fear of failure, that fear of what people are going to think about you, you know, just but I feel like as I don't know if it's a maturity thing. I don't know. I don't think it is, but I don't know. Just something happens and changes where hopefully most people get to a point where it's just like, F it, I'm going to, if it makes me happy, if it's something I really want to do and I'm passionate about it, I'm going to go for it. And I think once people hit that breaking point, that's where the crossroads happens in life. And that's where people need to make a decision. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, such a thing to be human in that sense i feel that so much whenever anybody talks about like the fear of failure that's been like such a huge part of so many things in my life as just do it man just do it if you really want to do it um i i think there is some i don't know it seems like maturing does have at least a little bit of an effect on there because i've noticed my threshold for for caring has shrunk as, yeah. as i've gotten older um but there is also a thing that and this isn't something that's actually in like the the dsm 5 or anything like that but it is something that's being looked into is the thing called rejection sensitivity um and basically it's it's this um it, it, and typically people who are not neurotypical tend to be more susceptible to that sort of thing so like um adhd uh autism spectrum disorder stuff like that um uh, basically where it, when i say rejection sensitivity some people might think oh well, i guess if your free fees get hurt or something like that and it's like no that's not what i'm talking about like what i'm talking about is whenever someone maybe is is being irritable because they, they're having a rough day or something and your first immediate reaction is oh i i must be a terrible person and done something or they i you know oh clearly they, they just tolerate my existence they actually can't stand me they're just being polite like that 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 kind of stuff is is what happens with rejection sensitivity so that's a little fun thing just to, to deal with <laughs> yeah um do you think some of it has like i've always thought when it comes mental wise i've always thought i wonder how many people do turn to 
substance abuse and drugs and things or alcohol things that you know even cigarettes things that get them out of their head get them out of that sober state in a sense they're almost trying to escape their own mental consciousness they're trying to like at least break away from it from situations like that where they do have anxiety or they are just getting lost in their head going around in circles and i mean at least speaking for myself that's a big reason why i mean i started probably drinking more than i should have was just trying to get that voice out of my head trying to just relax for a moment and not be paranoid and not be anxious and have anxiety about so many things and you know it worked but that it turned into a problem in and of itself so do you think people turn to substance abuse for similar reasons to try to escape that sobriety state I definitely think there's a good percentage of people that, that ends up being the thing. And then, of course, with this, with the substance in particular, there's a, a physiological change that happens. And then um, through a repetition of poor coping mechanisms, that's not an insult to the people. It's just like when you are using that to cope as like avoidance instead of like facing what's happening and like processing it in a healthy way then when you combine that repetition with the physiological changes that's happening, that's what ends up building the dependence up to where people then end up in a situation where they act in ways they wouldn't normally, like extreme examples being like stealing from people to get the money to pay for the, the substance, to either that, that kind of a thing. Someone who never would normally steal from somebody doing that because their brain is literally going, I need the thing. And and then it, it becomes a really vicious cycle. That's, that's hard to escape. Yeah, and it could even be more like even not as extreme examples it could be you know i mean you could argue to the severity of it but i mean even like moms or dads or just parents who like smoke in the car with their kids just because they need that fix right then and there you know or people who just have like a cup one drink or two drinks you know when they got kids with them and they're kind of like teetering on that line a bit a little bit it's it's like people can change other people's lives because of their dependency and I mean, I'm, I'm very, oddly enough, I'm like very libertarian when it comes to drug use. And, and I, I think people should be able to do with their bodies, what they wish to do with substances that are natural. And, um, you know, even if they change con, they, even if they change the way you perceive the world, um, I think that's still within our own rights to be able to do so. But at the same time, yeah, the dependency going from a celebratory kind of situation or a, a medicinal situation or like a very spiritual situation to a, a habitual problem, that's where that's where it really kind of becomes a, a big problem. Have you heard of any kind of like psychedelics being used in ways it, like mental health studies to help improve a lot of patients? Not anything that I'm necessarily familiar with right now. Um, I know there is some there is some s studies that are looking into more multicultural type of approaches. And what I mean by that is like an acknowledgement that a lot of the current research that we have is from a Western society perspective. And so there, there's questions on how much of that perspective is influencing like certain things like yeah. what are what are keyed on how certain data is interpreted um Legality. so there's that sort of examination that's happening so you could be looking into like uh medicinal healers if, if there's certain cultures that had that sort of a thing for example they, they might be looking into that to see the benefits the cons that kind of a thing yeah and there's also the legality aspect of it like it's it's hard to study it's hard to study things if you know your hands are tied behind your back and the government says you're not allowed to study it um and it almost makes you question like at what wh why would they make us studying and learning more information about substances illegal um that's a whole conversation for <laughs> in and of itself but oh yeah <laughs> i don't know where where do you have you noticed any kind of sense from other you know people in the mental health community what their kind of perceptions are when it comes to you know drug use should people be allowed to do it recreationally should it be more of like a medicinal thing i don't know like what are your thoughts on that have you heard others opinions on that i was gonna say I, i'm sure the perspectives kind of run the game it's just because you know different people would have different things i'm, yeah. I'm much more um <sighs> open-minded might not necessarily be the right phrase because that's almost like sounds like an insult to others but like 
my general philosophy with a lot of things is as long as it's not giving harm, like doing harm to someone else. Um, and you could make some arguments for self, depending on the circumstances, like it should be fine. So like if you were getting ready to operate a crane or something, obviously you should not be taking heavy psychedelics. Right. You're, You're putting other the people at risk. But, <laughs> but like if what you're doing is not going to harm someone else, why, why should it matter? You know, you, you know what I mean? Like, that's kind of my philosophy with it. Um, now, like for me, for example, one thing that I have come to the realization of, I, I mean, it's something I've known for a bit, but I thought maybe I could find like a right ratio, but it seems like even just like a little bit of alcohol, like the next day, for whatever reason, it tanks my mood really bad. So I'm like, all right, I just can't touch the stuff anymore. I'm just going to have to, to, to not have it because uh, I don't like feeling super depressed the next day because, <laughs> because well, of what's happened. It's also soup like alcohol is so weird. Like it's so weird that we live in a society that is so okay with alcohol, with drinking it. It's such a, a party thing. Our friends do it. People, man, people go to grocery stores and load up their carts with just piles of alcohol and something on the opposite end of the spectrum that does not have as much of a habitual form of dependency something else that just can truly transform people's lives and have absolutely profound effects on where their life goes in the future like psychedelics are just by some deemed so unsavory and and just such a negative connotation to it when things yeah like cigarettes or alcohol are legal i've always found it just so odd that you know you can get in trouble you can get thrown in jail in some states for having a joint of marijuana on you or cocaine or whatever and you get thrown in jail, but you could go to a liquor store and buy a whole liter of alcohol and yeah, drink it all that night and nobody would really care, you know, in a sense. It's it's yeah. weird that our society kind of perceives it like that. Well, and that part with the jailing things are left over from the whole war on drugs that's still happening where they have the mandatory minimum sentences of 10 years for people who have like one, one joint on them. It's ridiculous. Right. And then... Uh, you combine that with uh, the, the the mindset before, like you said, that was right about like cigarettes and alcohol. It's like, okay, why is this okay? And then like marijuana, for example, wasn't now that's been changing, but uh, at least with marijuana, uh, that has some history with like the hemp industry and like the timber industry and how apparent the, the, the certain powers that be yes. uh, were like, oh, our stuff is going to be threatened by hemp. So quick, let's just, you know, influence the lawmakers to make hemp illegal. Right. And uh and I think where it came to a head, this is something that's interesting that I noticed, was it seemed like where it came to a head was when it became open knowledge to people that the U.S. government held a patent for researching the healing properties of cannabis. Because it wasn't too long after that kind of saw light that it seemed like it was really pushing people towards, well, okay, well, then why is this illegal? And uh, that's when you kind of start seeing the change, like Denver, Colorado, and Colorado itself being like one of the first ones to really kind of lead the way with that sort of a thing yeah but yeah it was it's nuts i saw the thing I, it was on a facebook post of all things that i saw about the u.s patent thing with with the pot and you know how with facebook it's like 99 percent of the stuff on there you just you can't trust it at all but this was the one percent this was one of the one percents where it was actually true because i looked up um, on the u.s patent site and it's like yep there it is right there for for all the world to see Yep. Yep. That's man. That is the American way when it comes to politics in our government is like you let the people with the most conflict of interest influence the laws so they remain in power. It's it's incredibly frustrating. And I mean, that just happens more so now than ever when it comes to lobbying and just politicians and, and um, even like the pharmaceutical industry having its fingers in everybody and not allowing research to be done, keeping things criminalized um just constantly furthering this push of like the war on drugs and it's i think it's most people are beginning to wake up and realize that this war on drugs has just been a war on our entire society since it started so um and it's just the idea that you could throw somebody who has an actual dependency problem who has who struggles with whatever whatever it is um and decide to throw them in jail with murderers or rapists or whatever it is just it, it blows my mind that we still think like that today
or, or a kid who, um, you know, got caught with something like that because they made a bad decision that was fueled by horrible circumstances that they're in because of poverty and systemic racism and the influence that that brings right. and someone who otherwise has no business being in prison. Although I have my issues with the prison system in general with how it is in the U.S., but that's a whole other. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but uh, but yeah, like somebody who should otherwise not be in, in any sort of incarceration at all ends up being incarcerated for 10 years minimum because of that. And they've lost a, a decent chunk of their life because of something stupid like that. Yeah, and it's not even like the time they've lost. It's also the time afterwards where it's impossible for them. Not impossible. It's incredibly difficult for them to get a house, to get oh, a yeah, job, sure. to get an apartment. And it's like we punish these people so heavily by throwing them in jail. And then right when they come right back out, we just make it so likely that they're just going to get thrown right back in jail. It, it doesn't make any sense at all. And even when they are in jail, we're treating people like animals in cages and locking people up and i mean when you think about stuff like solitary confinement and how that's even still legal nowadays when that is a form of absolute mental torture um now it's... is that still legal because i was under the impression that enough governing bodies have now weighed in on that being legally ca or being ca recognized categorically as torture that i hope so it's been removed apparently or at least it's it's my general understanding is that now it's looked upon by powerful bodies as actual torture i would so. absolutely hope so um because it 100 yeah, it is i mean and even when you kind of jumping to like a different topic like military stuff and i mean even when you read stories about how some of our military members have initiated torture on other people through like waterboarding and stuff like that it's just man people i always i always say it but humans are interesting creatures the way we love certain things and hate others and just like it just doesn't make sense every time i like really think about just how humans treat one another throughout the world it just doesn't make any sense um now kind of stemming i guess on a totally different side of things i'm, I'm i knew we were gonna go into like super cool conversations like this and i have a ton more but before we dive too deep, I do have to ask yeah. Pilgrim, um, how is it streaming with sunglasses? I've always oh, loved okay. the badass look of it. Is it is it more oh, for right. the light protection? Well, with sunglasses, so like I got these right now. So if I put it oh, on, yeah. I got to get some replacement ones because there's like scratch speckles and stuff. So it makes it hard to see out of it. And, and sometimes like, especially if I'm doing something and the screen's like really dark, I have to like take these off because I can't see what I'm doing. Yeah. But, um, the main reason I wear them actually is because I gotta, I gotta find something for, um, a ring light. Um, I don't know, something that's like either like a blue light filter or a way to kind of like not make it to where it feels like my brains are being fried by the sun because that's pretty much that's that's pretty much why i'm wearing these is because I'm, i will just become stupid as the time goes on because I, I, my thinking processes get interrupted by the brightness intensity of the light that's shining on me that's so true it, it's it's the uh, yeah i have two lights on the side and just by the end of my stream i'm like soaked exhausted i feel like yeah. I, I feel like there's like a sunburnt on my forehead forehead Ooh. um but at the same time like streaming without lights on it would be you definitely want to have lights on like if i if i turn my lights off it, it no <laughs> we definitely need some oh, yeah. lights on <laughs> but that's that's why i went with the shades <laughs> i like it i like so. kind of get that doctor disrespect vibe just a little bit right uh, yes. <laughs> um the other one we did touch on it a moment ago but where does one find such a stellar outfit like the one in your bloodborne lore run because that oh, was man. just uh, good chef's kiss <laughs> um i'm trying to remember where i even got him uh because uh, i think i got some of the pieces on amazon maybe but like one of them one of them is from like a co Halloween costume thing, I think, or something. Mm -hmm. um, the top hat though was like a legit top hat, like it was eighty bucks. It wasn't. It wasn't a problem. <laughs> we need to make why? Why Actually, haven't top hats? Have why haven't top hats come back in fashion? Like we need to make know, top man. hats come back. Hang on a sec. Let me let me grab it real fast because I, I think I got it. Yeah. What do y'all think, everybody? We Should we make top hats a thing I gotta, again? I gotta widen the the brim oh yeah a little bit <laughs> yes yes 
I want to go to a basketball uh, game rocking one of I those. Sat it too, if I sat it too high on my, or hard on my head, like the, um, I think it was wide enough. Yeah, it's wide enough. But like my head is giant and like the front back here, it's like squeezes on my brain. I, I'm literally like cutting the circulation off to my brain oh. as I, if I put it on too hard. So I got to like sit it nice and loose up here, but here you go. I got it right here. Yeah, you, abs you just need like a saw cleaver and you're ready to go. You're ready to go. Maybe some insight. Oh yeah. Man, I miss Bloodborne. I, I, I want to pop that game on again here sometime. Isn't it so good? It's so, it's, it, I'm so happy I listened to my chat and like bought that game. And I was, I was so unsure of it because I'm like, I don't know if I want to play these, these souls game that everybody throws their controller at their TV in rage fits. Like, do I want to play that? Um, but yeah, Bloodborne is so amazing. Do you think they'll make a Bloodborne 2 at all? I honestly hope they don't. Hope they don't. Just, just because From Software tends to do their best work when they do new IPs, or at least that's what it seemed like. Like, I don't I don't, I don't want another Dark Souls 2 again. <laughs> I mean, Dark Souls 2 was a little interesting though, because like Miyazaki was like five percent involved on it he was kind of like some he was kind of the thumbs up okay move to the next stuff from what i from what i've read but most yeah. of it was handled by like a lot of other people just a lot of who worked on dark souls one but a lot of just different kind of perspectives on it. it it's almost like it almost feels like more of a demon souls 2 to me whereas like dark souls 3 a lot like everyone who plays dark souls 3 says they love it and that feels like a real dark souls 1 sequel one of the only thing I didn't really care for too much with Dark Souls 3 was like how many times they were like, oh, look, see thing from Dark Souls 1. It's here. Ah, don't you love oh, it? References. Like, so some of it was pretty on the nose. Some of it not so much. Um, but yeah, Dark Souls 2, I, I will say, especially with the most recent run through the, the, the toothpicks thing, as I like to call it. Even though it's caused me to like really, really not be a fan of, of, of Dark Souls 2. It is amazing that it is as cohesive as it is, um, given the development stuff that they had happen. Because basically, they had the assets made, they they had built it up to a certain point, and then when they had like I think less than a year left, they had to like scrap it and basically start from scratch with a lot of things. And so they had to essentially figure out how they were going to put the existing stuff together and like mess some other things up. So when some of it seems a bit hodgepodge, that's because it is. <laughs> because of what happened yeah I, w I wonder if just having like at what point do, does having a deadline actually take away from what a game truly could be but if you don't ever have a deadline the game will never be done for a lot of developers yeah. but yeah like you hear horror stories about i mean we've i've talked about before like cyberpunk having that deadline whether it was the investors who decided to push it out or what but yeah just kind of having that deadline can cause some not so good things to exactly happen yeah yeah um but yeah i i really admire that from software does that with their games like they'll have sekiro elden ring demon souls bloodborne um dark souls yeah one two and three but like they do these individual ips and make them all unique all fresh like sekiro so different than bloodborne they all look so mm -hmm. different than elden ring um so I think that's really cool. It really reminds me, I've mentioned it before, but it really, totally reminds me of Final Fantasy and the way they do like Final Fantasy seven, it's an amazing game, but by the time it comes out, they're already moving on to eight. They make an amazing game in eight, then they move on to nine and they're just going so fast from one project to another that they don't have time to, I don't know, make a, a Final Fantasy nine part two or a nine part three, you know, Mo most, I mean, of course now we have seven remake and all the seven stuff but like traditionally back in the day that's how they did it and you just see them knock out like classic after classic after classic and it's because they're not reveling too much in like hey people really like this final fantasy 7 game maybe we should make a part two or part three you know it's like no 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 we're done with that game it had its story and we're moving on i really yeah. admire that a lot oh oh same same yeah like with the dark souls games i mean dark souls my understanding was like Dark Souls 2 and 3 just basically came about because Bandai Namco was like, all right, money here. <laughs> they were right. like, all right, pay the bills, I guess. But even by like 
Yeah, have you done Dark Souls 3, right? You've done Dark Souls 3. I haven't right played Dark Souls 3. I've watched a lot of my friends stream it, though, so I've definitely been spoiled a lot in it. It, it looks okay. very much like Bloodborne. I see a lot of Bloodborne in it. Yeah, they use the same engines. That's part of the reason why. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, you could definitely tell, like, especially when you go through like the DLC, that it was Miyazaki's way of basically being like, all right, what's done is done. Every good thing has to come to an end. It's over. Ride it out to the sunset. Don't let it, you know, let that kind of a thing. Like, you need to move on, basically, kind of thing. So, like, when I hear people talk about Dark Souls 4 and stuff like that, I'm like, no, you've completely missed the point. <laughs> <laughs> At least while Miyazaki's in charge. Um, yeah. But yeah, like, I, I could definitely see if they would not do a Bloodborne Part 2 or anything. Um, I, it would, from an artistic perspective, it makes a lot of sense. And, I mean, props props to Miyazaki and his team to be able to probably resist the amount of money that Sony's throwing at them or their companies are throwing at them to not give in and you know like everybody wants a Bloodborne 2 let's make a Bloodborne 2 they're like no 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 no. we want to do our own thing have our own story and it's really like those masterminds who who, who really are able to do that because I think if if they did give in and did do a Dark Souls 4 or a Bloodborne 2, it would just be too easy, you know? And and Miyazaki wants to work on new things like Elden Ring. I mean, obviously, I see a lot of Dark Souls 3 as well in Elden Ring. Do you uh, see yeah. it? I didn't, I didn't watch any of the trailers and stuff just because I've tended to avoid game trailers now because of the fact that Show uh, there's been a couple of times where they've just like spoiled big parts of a game in the trailer itself. So I'm like, yeah, no, I'm just not gonna, just not gonna watch any of that stuff probably oh. wise um yeah they they same with movie trailers you can watch a movie trailer now and you see the entire movie in like two minutes and you're like well what's oh, yeah. what's the point <laughs> <laughs> um yeah th that always bugs me when you watch a trailer and they do stuff like that um when it comes to like streaming though i know right now you're playing pokemon iron mon i kind of talked to you a little bit about it earlier today for those that oh, don't yeah. know how that challenge run works could you kind of explain what it is exactly sure well iron mon it's something that as far as i know uh the streamer i at your pie kind of came up with like the settings for it and stuff so like the rules link that i have use in my stream it's just basically linking to his pastebin because like he's already got the thing and like i think i even make mention in there that it's his thing that we're doing but um basically it's taking the idea of the nuzlocke and then applying a bunch of extra challenge runs to it so in a nuzlocke run like one of the big defining things is that once you're able to catch them on you whenever you go to like a new area the first thing that you run into that's what you have the option of catching or defeating and then that's it like now in Nuzlocke's you can technically grind up xp some people will play with a restriction that doesn't allow you to do that iron mon doesn't let you grind on wild pokemon you get xp from the trainers and that's it gotcha. so um now where it's different slightly from nuzlocke is that you're not locked into the first thing you run into that's what you have to do you can be selective with, with it but once you commit you commit so like gotcha. if you if it self-destructs and and blows itself up or, or something like that you, you don't get another shot it, it, that's it your thing's done for that section if they ko do you you have to release them Oh uh, yes, yeah. They're the, so the permadeath thing's the same. Like if if they faint, you treat it like they're released. Now, a lot of times, a lot of times when people do nuzlocks, they will have it so where you can't use items in trainer battles. That is not on with Iron Mon, but the trade-off is the only items you can buy are the different tiers of of pokeballs and the different tiers of repels and that's it oh, so okay. anything else that you find or any other like if you're going to he use healing items for battles and stuff like that you can only use what you find so and it's randomized so you may get a seed where you find like two potions and that's it that's all you got <laughs> and, so... you, and you can do that that challenge with like any of the games right and it's not specific to one game Oh yeah, yeah. You can do them with with any of them. Um, yeah, those are, those are randomizers, pretty robust out there. Uh, basically, with Iron Mon, you set it up so like all the item things are shuffled around, like the TMs are sh are shuffled around. What what the TMs teach are shuffled around. The move tutor yeah. stuff shuffled around. The 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 move sets for the Mons are shuffled around. What they evolve into is is shuffled based on like what types they are. And it, there's like this calculator where it looks at like, okay, if this Mon evolved into this Mon, this is what the total base stats would be. So based off of that, 
any of the mons that match the types that they that the current one is that falls within this certain bracket that's what it could evolve into that kind of a thing Very um the abilities the mons have are randomized the um the the like what they learn is randomized so yeah a lot of a lot of, a lot of randomization that happens and all wild pokemon and the trainer pokemon are 50 percent higher levels than what they would be normally so like when you're fighting gary at the starting battle his mon's level eight and yours is level five so there, there's that sort of thing happening yeah gotcha gotcha um i think i've always thought it'd be really cool if games like when you beat them at the end of them you know how in some games they unlock hard mode or new game plus or something like that i always thought it'd be cool <clears throat> if they unlocked like a randomizer mode where you play through oh, the game and you can like customize and maybe randomize all the items or randomize the bosses or i feel like that would be so many people would dig that if video games did that i want to say I, I i think that i feel like i've seen somewhere like there was a game that an indie studio made recently that did that sort of a thing i i, I don't know though it's like a very vague thing on the back of my mind so i could just be piecing together things but like it, it seems like i saw something like that somewhere i'm not sure but either way more devs yes please that'd be awesome that would be awesome <laughs> i want i want to buy dark souls one on my pc just so i can do that and randomize it because it really is like you're playing through the game in a different way i mean it's i guess oh, the yeah. locations are still kind of the same but aside from the locations you could get like a totally different weapon set or get like different enemies or different bosses. There's just, it, it's, I, I like when people take games that we've all seen a million times and just make them different, add, add challenges to them, like speed running randomizers. It just breathes new life into the games, you know? Oh, definitely. With uh, with Dark Souls, one of the favorite runs I had seen was something that Lobos Jr. had done where he was, uh, you know, randomizing the, the equipment and items and stuff like that around. And uh, it was a use what you see run. So basically, like if he saw an item, he had to pick it up and he had to immediately equip it no matter what his stats were <laughs> and then go with that. So like if he if he had a nice sword that he built up and was working and he found like this giant chonky hammer that he didn't have the stats to use. Well, guess what? You're going to be slapping him with a little limp noodle the whole time until you <laughs> have you seen the Gwyn run where have you seen the Gwyn run in Dark Souls one, the randomized Gwyn's? Uh, no, you talking about like the randomized boss stuff? Did they do that with, with Gwyn or something? So somebody took all of the NPCs, bosses, enemies, everything, and changed them into the final boss Gwyn. So oh, literally Okay, everything. yeah, I have seen that, yeah. Oh, it's it's amazing to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, sure. It's, it's so cool because like when you go to Gwyn, it, like there's so much illumination around him because of the fi his fire sword so you're essentially playing through the whole entire dark souls one game and you just see fireballs everywhere it's like the entire world is on fire <laughs> because there's every single enemy even like the blacksmiths and the npcs and everything has been changed to gwen and it's it's hilarious nice. that's awesome <laughs> that'd be a wild run um oh for sure kind of stemming a little bit more on like the mental health side of things one question i think that would be really really fascinating are is what are some of the mental health hurdles you've encountered since you've started streaming or uh making content creation uh i think probably one of the biggest things is um comparing myself to others and uh that in tandem with my ambitions and what I want to achieve and the the hurdles that I feel of like my my own mental health issues and stuff causing me to not meet up to that, like getting exhausted super easy with things or like, you know, discouragement, like I, I, I deal with situations where like if you, if you get discouraged, sometimes it can be really easy for me to just like throw up my hands and just kind of give up and or, or like just kind of like, you know, be like effort and and just you know go go off in like an unhealthy sort of like withdrawal from everything and everyone kind of thing and and like I've, I've gotten better with that but sometimes it can like you know kick in and get you when you're not ready for it um so yeah i think i think um just dealing with like having to like find a way to still try to reach and achieve like you know the ambitions that i have but in ways that acknowledge the stuff that I have to deal with. Um, uh, not not like letting it defeat me, but more so being 
I guess, realistic about it, just so that way I'm not setting myself up to be disappointed constantly because <laughs> because of stuff. And then um, and then that kind of jumping into like or like fueling the comparison with others of being like, man, if only I could just get my shit together, or maybe I, you know, would be doing a lot better because I'd be doing all these different things and, and, and it being like, OK, well, what can I actually do to like what what things can I actually work on and do better with? And what are some things that I just have to accept or limitations that I have to deal with and, and figure out a way to, to work around them? So I, I think that's probably been like the biggest thing for me. Essentially, just like what you can control versus what's outside of your control. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a lot of people I've talked to who stream on Twitch or just even YouTubers and stuff have really I don't know if it's just comes with the territory but there really is like a a mental you're just always comparing yourself to somebody else you're always thinking about like i should be doing more i can i want to be doing more um and then when you have these high expectations for yourself it's so easy to say i want to do this and then something comes up that's outside of our control and then we just cannot do that um so yeah it's it's i've struggled with it as well i know a lot of people i've talked to have also struggled with it do you do any kind of like breathing exercises or like warm <laughs> showers or like what's the what's the go-to strategy to kind of try to wave off those emotions i'll be honest i'm still trying to figure out some of the stuff <laughs> if anybody knows <laughs> send work. us a dm um i i, I think i th- I, I think part of what's helped me is that even when I have kind of like felt defeated and maybe had to take like a week or two away just to kind of like regroup or whatever, um, was I, I guess I don't really know how this would necessarily help others because everyone's different. But like for me, it's just kind of like a situation of where like deep down, like I know it's something I want to do and like that can help fuel sometimes uh, to where like even if i do kind of give up temporarily i will come back to it because i'm like yeah i've what i have managed to to build up and do is too precious to just you know throw it away basically so it's that's kind of what helps fuel me there i guess and then just i don't know right now i i just kind of am trying to be like all right i'm gonna do the best that i can um even if it's just like, all right, focusing on this this one little thing, that's something that's that's diff- different and I'm doing something with it that wasn't being done before. So it's a step in the right direction, even if it's like super baby steps. Yeah, it, baby it's better steps, than nothing. Taking one baby step a day is so can be so much more powerful than wanting to take a gigantic leap forward. And then you just keep thinking that to yourself and then you never take that gigantic leap. So even if it's just a small minute change, 1% better every single day, you'll look back in yourself in three months, six months, a year, and you'll be like, holy crap, I've, I've made some good progress. So yeah. I, that, do you think that's also something a lot of people struggle with is this idea they have such high expectations for themselves. They see people they look up to. I'm like I want to do that I want to be just like that but they don't see the years of progress it took to get there or they don't see kind of the behind the scenes of how they prepare for their role yeah I think that can play well let me let me let me, let me correct make a correction there. yeah that definitely plays a part I I do think though I, I've seen some people who I, I've seen some chatter before about like the luck aspect of things and like some people have been pretty dismissive about that being a factor and i'm like it is a thing whether you want to acknowledge it or not because like like especially as twitch has become more saturated and, and and stuff there is an aspect of like if you know if you know the right people or have the right connections that definitely goes a long way mainly when it comes to like exposure or like like people being aware of you because like if you know somebody who has got a sizable audience and you know they they you know are are like a friend to you or whatever so like you know they'll do stuff to like help you out or whatever that kind of a thing like it makes it easier for people to know about you when there's a, you know right. what i mean like there's an audience there as opposed to like you know banging on the corner street corner basically <laughs> trying to get somebody to see you there's going to be a difference there um so i i think that does play a factor and i think some people downplay the factor uh, that happens whether because they had a privilege they just didn't stop and think about or because now that they've gone to a better or they, they, they've they achieved some higher level of success now they've forgotten about the stuff they had to deal with before like I, I think I think maybe something like that could be at play there but 
there there is there is also the importance of recognizing that there is work that goes into it and there is stuff behind the scenes because yeah you can have the luck and have folks see you but like what are you, what are you going to do to to convince them to want to stick around you know what i mean like that 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 is a factor as well and um and, and then there's other things that are just kind of outside your control sometimes the people that come around just may not be into the stuff that you're doing or they may be at first and then they might just decide to go away and there's nothing that you can do to control that and uh and that and that's another thing too is that sometimes that discouragement can come in because you, you can think like oh what did i do it has to be something with me and it may have very well not have been I mean, right right um yeah i totally agree 100 percent with all of that like i think people get so caught up in numbers or like specific metrics to look at and they compare themselves to others and say you know i started streaming earlier or you know maybe i stream longer or i do this or that or whatever why are these other people receiving success and it's it's easy to think that way um but i think it's also important to put that mental i don't know that mental exercise in place of instead of just coming from like that jealous aspect ever of asking the why like what are they doing specifically that has catapulted them or is getting them some growing viewership or whatever um i i think a lot of times asking that why is incredibly important and it's hard to do it's really hard to do it's easy to just be like oh i don't like pokemane because of x reason i'm getting out of here but when you ask like why why do people watch this particular person or like what exact value do they bring to people um i think everybody has something unique and something different and i think there is definitely a matter of luck for sure um but i've always thought like as long as you're really good at what you do making content or streaming or doing x y and z as long as you're really good at what you do once luck comes around that's when you can take it and catapult yourself because sometimes people i mean sometimes people get rated by five thousand viewers and they don't have the content or they don't have the the experience or they're not ready for that viewership so to say so luck came and gave it something to them but they weren't prepared and ready and didn't know how to exactly take hold of it you know and that's a really good point too yeah because I mean, I, I don't know what I would do necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'd be nice to have eyeballs in me, but like, right. would I do well with like a bunch of things flying up on the screen? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'd be on top of my game that day. Maybe I wouldn't be. Um, I mean, the other but thing yeah, it's and, and that's that's a hard thing to have to deal with is like dealing with that jealousy, especially like in a healthy way. Because I mean, I've, I've gone through that shit before, like, you know, um, like dealing dealing with that and not at least for me fortunately it wasn't like a, oh they don't deserve it and i do kind of thing it was just like why can't i measure up that right. that was kind of like how it was going and um i still struggle with it sometimes but like i think it's I, I do try to take an honest assessment and being like okay well there are some things that i realize i haven't really worked on like i want to and that probably could be playing a factor and then like trying to to weigh out okay Here's the things I can control. Here's the things I can't control. There's no real easy way of being able to know how much of it is column A and how much of it is column B. Right. Um, especially because like reading the metrics on Twitch sometimes feel like reading hieroglyphics, trying to understand what's <laughs> like data right. trends yes. <laughs> that, that are happening. Um, because like, like for example, the, it, it tells me that oh, a highest percentage of viewers are interested in just chatting streams. And yet whenever I've done like the just chatting stuff lately, it's been, it's had the, like the, the worst rates when it comes to like viewership so it's like i don't i don't know what to do with that yeah <laughs> as far as like trying to notice trends and like trying to identify what audience your audience is truly interested in for example that's that's kind of the context i'm meaning it in. I'm, i think twitch does i mean i think all the social media platforms are so focused on numbers like numbers yeah. of subscribers or followers or viewers or x y and z retweets likes all of that and we've become such a a number focused society that's why people use social media they post things like oh how many likes did i get how many comments did i get or how many retweets did i get or whatever and it really does i feel like take away a lot of the humanity aspect of it and that's one thing i really mm -hmm. do enjoy a lot about twitch is the the in real time interaction with every person i know that there's somebody a real person behind sending that message and it becomes just such a more human 
I don't know, a human type of way of communicating with people. I mean, this is probably as most human as it can get aside from meeting in real person. Um, so the sure. podcast is like even leagues above beyond that, like being able to talk to people in real time has been outstanding, but yeah, it's almost like how much of this is human? Just that sense of jealousy or like, I want to do better. I want to measure up. And I'm sure all of us, I know like pretty much everybody I've talked to who does any kind of content creation, Twitch, YouTube, anything like that. It's just, it, it's, it kind of is unfortunately part of the territory where numbers are like shoved in your face, but the more you look at numbers, kind of the worse it gets. It's almost like yeah. you really have to just focus on what you really enjoy doing, what makes you happy and excited and you stream and you're like, I really get the most value for myself out of this and my audience seems to like it and just trying to find those two together. Um, for me <clears> specifically, <throat> it's been like just chatting. I love just chatting with people and talking about their days and everything. And some people oh, might, yeah. yeah, might not like that. They might be like, I'm here for dark souls gameplay. I don't know why you'd watch me for dark souls gameplay, <laughs> but like, <laughs> but, but, but like, yeah, I think it's important to just find that within yourself, find whatever, genre that is niche that is music on twitch or 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 art on twitch or dark souls or whatever your cat the category that you love to do um just be really really happy with it people will sense that happiness and then just always ask yourself after every stream like what could i what could i do better you know like what am i proud of that i did what was what did i do pretty solid but genuinely mm. what could i do better and yeah, there was a lot of months of obsessing about that myself. And even still to this day, it's just always like, what can I do better? How can I do better? Um, and yeah, I think just the more you focus on numbers, it's kind of like getting lost in the in the forest, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. And, and that's the thing that sucks is, yeah, like you said, a lot of, a lot of the stuff looks at uh, metrics and stuff. And so that obsession with metrics fuels I, I i think at least it fuels that, uh, that that whole comparison thing and stuff because people you know, like if you get into streaming and having any remote awareness of like what's going on i mean how even the dashboard itself is like ah do you meet these numbers right. for like affiliate numbers, for example numbers, and so numbers, then numbers. right away it's like priming you to to f look at numbers and borderline fixate on them and it especially sucks is if you're trying to look for like data trends if you're trying to find a niche or whatever so like then you have to be aware of, of the numbers or else you're not going to look at the metrics but it can also really mess with your head if you're not careful and yeah i um it's it's definitely hard it's definitely hard um there was a couple other things that you mentioned that i was like oh yeah those are good points and i have just completely lost <laughs> what they are Good old ADHD kicking in again. You're totally uh, good. Um, I have like two kilobytes of memory. So, so many times people will be talking and I'm like, ooh, let's save that for later. And then, yeah, I, I totally miss it. I almost need like sticky notes right in front of me or something. I will say I was chuckling earlier uh, when you were mentioning the um, the human interaction thing, just because I was, I, my mind was thinking of like the bots that come in and go, ah, Want I can famous? make this thing for you. Do you right. <laughs> do you want follows or like it talks about like making art for you and stuff? So that that's just that's why I was chuckling because I was thinking of that. Yeah, they're everywhere. Want to be famous? No, I don't want to be famous. Would you? I mean, if given the opportunity, would you want to be famous? Have you thought about that at all? Oh. Uh i'll be honest that's that's a good question because like i don't really want to be but i i do want to at least i don't know i want i want to i want to have a decent reach of like being able to help make people's lives better and like you know being able to enrich people's lives with the content i make and 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 being able to put out like education on mental health stuff and like music's another thing that's very important that i haven't i haven't really done too much with for a bit uh, but i miss it a lot and i can tell because like anytime i like pick up the instrument and start playing like just the surge of joy that goes through me i'm like i really need to make this like a regular thing because this is just too important to me not to not to do so people that don't play music uh, it's almost like it's hard to relate exactly how powerful it can be because man there's there's very few things better than having if you have a bad day at work or just something's going on in life just plugging in a guitar or picking up a guitar or whatever and just closing your eyes and just strumming some chords it's so it's like meditative it's so cathartic mm -hmm. and just so inward in yourself um yeah I, that's piano and guitar has always kind of been my go-to to just close my eyes zone out and kind of 
do my own thing. Yeah, man, for sure. Um, what is your best advice if you kind of have any advice when it comes to dealing with anxiety before streaming and during streaming? Because I know I've talked to a lot of people who right before they press that go live button, they kind of start to get a little couple butterflies. And do you have that experience at all? Do you have any advice for dealing with it or anything that you do? Yeah, um, I, I don't really get it too much now. Um, me with if I was to be like playing music, I probably would start getting a little bit nervous. But that's mainly because I'm worried about my body breaking down on me and making the tour. I can't really play the guitar that well. <laughs> so that's that's the main thing there. But um, as far as like getting ready to start the stream up, that there there are on rare occasion now I'll still deal with that. And I remember dealing with it a lot earlier on and like. Oh. I don't see with this sort of advice it almost sounds like ah oh, just do it forehead because like I don't really do you think it's know. tied to us caring too much what people think again like we're just like oh are people gonna like me or or is what's gonna happen it's like don't worry about that just go yeah yeah and and, and that's the thing like I, I'm always hesitant of like I'm always sound hesitant and like fumble over myself almost whenever I start talking about that because. I recognize how harmful the stuff can be when people are just like, ah, oh, just do it. it you right. know, just, ah, oh, just feel, feel better. Ah, oh, yes. Thank you. I never thought of that before. <laughs> like when it comes right. to depression, let me just will it away. Um, so I don't want to come across like that when I'm talking about it is why I start getting awkward with it. But, um, I, I guess I, I'm just trying the only, the only thing that I could really say is like, if you are feeling anxious about it, like, there might be some days where like maybe it is so overwhelming that you need to take a take a step back just because uh, especially like if you're on the cusp of like burning out or something or, or like if you're yes. just like dealing with a lot of stuff in your life that it's really got you like built on edge uh, but there's also been times where like i've needed to do it and i just was getting nervous about doing it and it was essentially avoidance um uh, and in that situation it really was best for me to just go ahead and, and push the live and and do the thing right and as soon as i got into it boom i got in the rhythm and the anxiety was gone so it, it's easier said than done i get it but that's that's like the thing i've experienced is just being like hey i realize i'm nervous like kind of acknowledging that and then just being like i'm just gonna do it anyway there's like this fine balance between like, are you, do you not want to stream because like, this is how I've always thought of it for myself. Like, do I not want to stream right now because I'm being lazy? Do I not want to stream right now because I'm having like mental health and like, I'm having a really, I, I should probably not be streaming today. Um, am I, you know, do I not want to stream because I am on that verge of burnout? And that's happened a couple times where I'm just like, I need to take today off or I need to take a week off. And when I come back, just like re-energized, ready to go. But yeah, I've always thought that with myself too. Like if I'm feeling like I don't want to do it because I want to sleep in for the morning because I, I stream super early in the morning, like right when I get up. So I'm like, is it because I want to sleep in or is it because I'm lazy or like those are the moments where I tell myself, no, get up, just do it. But then there have been days where like I wake up and I didn't get any sleep at all. I'm super groggy and don't feel good. Um, or just reaching that burnout point where just doing so much stuff. I'm like, I just really need a day off. And those are the, the fine moments you need to know. You need to understand that about yourself with anything in life. Like is today a day where I really should take some time for myself to, to heal, to rest, to recover, to, to treat yourself a little bit today, or are you being lazy and you probably should go forward and do it? You know, it's, it's good to know that about yourself. Yeah, I, I would say lazy can be a thing. It can also be fear. It can also fear. be um, sometimes I mean, the best way to is lazy or fear. Sometimes the best way to <laughs> overcome fear is to push forward and to do it. But mm -hmm. I think also it's just like a one size all doesn't fit everybody, you know. And I think the exactly. more you understand about yourself, understand your emotions, understand where you're coming from from like a mental head space, from an emotional space, then you can make more of a right decision. But yeah, I think if people are are wanting to stream or be in front of a live audience or giving a presentation to people and they're worried, they're kind of getting those butterflies, just, just go for it. And who cares what they think, you know? 
in that hey, sense. And hey, look at this way. This is kind of a joke, but it also is kind of true. Like, once you do something crazy, like put on a Yoshi, a full body Yoshi costume or like a, a Princess Zelda dress, man. Who cares about like getting embarrassed or like thinking that people are gonna like make you feel bad about yourself or whatever? You already thrown any sort of shame out the window, so there you go. You can... <laughs> right, right. I think I think people need to laugh at themselves more. I think, man, people we people are so damn serious about themselves and just are looking for I don't know social media brownie points everywhere and just people are so aggressive and so mean to so many people and I'm like. We just, we just need to laugh at ourselves more to look in the mirror more whilst I think simultaneously taking more ownership for things in our life and taking ownership for things in society. Like there's so many things, but oh, yeah. I, I think a big part of it is people just don't laugh at themselves as much. You know, we need to be able to look in the mirror and that's something I'm, I would say, actually, I do enjoy about myself in a sense like i'm very easy to just laugh at myself and if trolls come in and start saying things like i'll totally just roll with it and start kind of just having fun with it and i don't let any of it get to me like i'll, I'll always be the first to laugh at myself and i'll probably be the the loudest one laughing and just because I, like i don't take myself seriously and i think by thinking that way you know just anything that kind of gets thrown at you can bounce off in a way it might not be a good idea to always do that but you know just to kind of find those situations where giggling at yourself and laughing it can go a long way oh sure it's definitely a important skill to have i i, I think it's kind of like that so lack of ego. That. it's like that lack of ego um I've, I've i've been reading um a lot of stuff about like psychedelics and stuff recently and one thing a lot of people talk about is the sense of losing one's ego and kind of having that sense of you know what people think about you or how people are going to come across just you in general and kind of getting devoid of that in a sense and losing that sense of ego and just kind of becoming more one with I, I know it might sound like hippie or whatever to say but just kind of becoming more one with your community with your friends with your relationships and family and uh yeah it's I, I always make the joke, but I'm like, maybe just everyone needs to take mushrooms and then just hold hands and the world will be a better place. Hey, you know what? You never know until uh, you try. Uh, I'm, to the, I'm to the point of like, hey, you know, we could do worse things to try. <laughs> but uh, yeah, right. it, it's interesting that you, you said that, though, because that had me thinking of like the balance between individualism and like collectivism as far as like those different perspectives are concerned because a lot of the a lot of societies around the world like there are more societies around the world that have a collectivist type of mentality than there are individualistic so in, in the individualistic mindset is actually in the minority not not the majority um but i i'm in like this like hybrid thing because there are certain aspects of like individualism i do think is important like personal freedom in particular but um there are a lot of aspects to like collectivist or collectivist stuff that i also um admire and have respect for and, and think are important I, I think for me like the the biggest thing that i have hesitancy for with like the collectivist thing is is the potential for authority to be abused and and how that how you, you could essentially suppress someone's like true desires because for, for for like suppress them and it be something that shouldn't be suppressed in my opinion at least and that and that is where i would take the biggest issue with like a collectivist thing whereas with individualistic would be like the very selfish aspects of that stuff i i'm i'm not really keen on so that that's kind of where i i fall with that sort of dynamic i mean could you see kind of jumping into specific issue do you think you could see china being on one side of that and the united states being on the other side of that you know one is very I, i'm sure they're like they're both selfish very much so in their own way and, and wanting what's right for their country and everything but china is like an absolute powerhouse when it comes to just getting stuff done and they can they like they can snap their finger and build hospitals overnight it's absolutely insane but of course that comes with such a huge downfall of individual liberty and freedom and and them being able to make their own choices and in, in an individual sense like it's it's almost so far on that collectivism side whereas i mean the united states 
we can just we can go to town on on the selfishness and the self-centeredness and and the idea that you know we're the best in the world we can go to town on, on that whole philosophy well an interesting thing is even with mentioning that perspective of like lack of freedom and stuff like that that itself kind of betrays how the individualistic influence kind of shapes our perspective because with with collectivist societies and different ones have some different variations on like view of self and stuff like that there's no one size fits all but like right. there there tends to be a thing with like collectivist society where the concept of self itself is different like on a very fundamental level so like whereas us in, in the u.s and individual individualistic society look at it's like me. identity as self this individual person collectivist societies don't typically see it that way they see the the self as part of the whole or like they see their identity of self as me and my relation to like my family or my local community or things like that so it's a completely different way of looking at what self means so like e even just that sort of frame of mindset is completely different on a level that when you stop and think about it like it's hard for me to like wrap my head around completely because it's just a, a totally different way of looking at the world and like I can try to understand it but there's certain aspects of it that just are just gonna right <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah it's it's a weird I mean I don't think one or the other is right or wrong I don't, I don't know like some hybrid of the two but there's so many things when it comes to a lot of um just like Eastern societies really. And, and co countries like, you know, South Korea and Japan and, you know, China and Singapore and just all these countries that do have more of that, uh, collectivism type of mentality and just the way people fit within each other in a larger group society. It's, there's so many great things to take away from it. And this is like almost different philosophy they have of self, like mm -hmm. you we're just mentioning compared to, yeah, Western countries. And I don't know, I don't have very much, uh, I don't know when it comes to talking about some of the pros and cons of like living in the United States, it's, it's I feel like the more I learn, the more depressed <laughs> is probably the word for it. Just my cons list has gotten bigger and bigger as time is going. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that isn't to like at all take away from a lot of the amazing things like the country's done in, or the United States has done in terms of inventions and, you know, helping other countries around the world. But like when it comes to just a lot of the imperialism stuff and expanding and, and just, um, overthrowing governments and military shadiness stuff and you know rich getting richer economic systems and political influences and there's just every single topic you can go down the list has just been corrupted so deeply and it's it's the personal favorite of mine is the reason for the the iraq war like both the original one and like you know later because like the nerve agents that got used on various people, uh, people's air or whatever, when you go back and look at like even the congressional budgetary records and stuff, the US is responsible for half of the materials, like the, that regime there getting them. So it's just like, ah, yes, uh, we were we were like the biggest reason they even had the stuff to begin with. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, like you said, this isn't like a, like, ah, oh, I hate the US. It's just like, the, the especially as post-capitalism starts to come about, there, there's more and more things that it's like, yeah, this is messed up. This should change. And the fact that it just seems like it's hard to make a change is what's really discouraging. It's frustrating to listen to a lot of mainstream media or people who follow a lot of mainstream media. And there's so many people who just think like, if you're criticizing something, you just hate it and you can't have any other kind of nuanced or gray argument. And it just seems like in our country, everything is black and white and nothing in life really is black and white. There's it's all gray. And if you just disagree on something, you're labeled a, a supporter of the other side and team you're on team red or you're on team blue. And it's all just a bunch of bullshit. And <laughs> like, I feel yeah. like so many people I've talked to, so many people I've talked to have just kind of becoming more on that independent side of thinking and just realize like a two both party system is absolute trash and both are absolute corrupt and both are absolutely influenced by money and corporations and power have just just have their hands in everything and you know it's 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 really frustrating I, I think I said it on 
one of the last few pot i think i said it when i was talking to my buddy cranberry pudding last week is like when it comes to politics in this country literally the cancer of our society is money in politics money being able to change politicians opinions on certain subjects and no matter what what at all people want to discuss healthcare infrastructure military education any any subject whatsoever at all you will, will never be able to dive into any of those subjects really while corporations are feeding money to politicians to influence yeah. their behavior so yeah legal bribery exists and that's what ends up fueling that stuff yeah because individuals don't have the same pool of resources that giant corporations do so by right. default that ends up leading to what we're experiencing now right like we can't even have a real discussion on something like a, a social socialized healthcare system or like a pure capitalist capitalistic type of healthcare. we can't even have that conversation because it's, there's not a conversation to be had there's going to be the politicians who are corrupt by corporations who are going to steer the way that they want it to go and it's 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 just so frustrating because like i'm not one side or another when it comes to a lot of issues i don't believe in being married to ideas i'm very i'm always open to any kind of argument that people have it doesn't mean i'll agree with it right away but i'm always open to hear discussions and ideas and thoughts and if you just get married to an idea that this is the way this has to be the way it has to be i feel like real substantial evidence could come out and just go right over people's heads and then you just kind of get in a situation where you're kind of becoming the thing you fight against you know you're agreeing with something because it's on your team versus what the actual facts are and but we can't even sure. have any of that discussion while money is just cancerously eating our system from the inside out so yeah if there's one thing i'm like extremely passionate about it's it's money and politics and like literally if there's one issue i would ever run for politics on it would just be that because like whatever other conversation we want to have afterwards we cannot even discuss until this gets taken care of i mean that's a very good point yeah yeah i i, I i'm pretty similar when it comes to like being open with certain things i may i may have some initial resistance if i'm in particular about like a like or particularly attached to like a certain a thing but evidence, i will try right? to overcome that bias and right. and listen at least uh now one thing that i am pretty like that it does hit pretty close to home for me is like um like homelessness and like the systems that perpetuate that and like the the, the thing when it comes to like money inequality and well i would dare say how capitalism itself is fueled on by or fueled by it's a system that is fueled by ah there are to, for those to have many there are others that have few and right. and i while i'm open on like suggestions for how to make things better and stuff like that i just don't think I don't think it's possible, at least for me personally, I have the opinion that I don't think it's possible to be ethical and think it's okay for some to do without or to have lack while others have excess. And that admittedly is fueled by life experiences I've had where I, I did a, a lot of work with people in impoverished situations and stuff like that. So I've seen it up close and personal and it's uh, when you see something like that, it, it's hard to have your mind changed from from that sort of viewpoint, at least when it comes to that specific sort of thing yeah and and you always hear things from like the other side of it people arguing against it that they just want to like make million like have take your 401k or, or raise taxes on like us 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 people and it's like that's the problem i really have when it comes to communication is you can say something i can say a sentence and we can both perceive it in completely different ways so and I mean, that's being taken completely out of context nowadays when it comes to terms like liberal or what conservative means or what raising oh, yeah. taxes mean. Like people on completely different news channels can say the exact same thing, but their audiences can perceive them and perceive them in totally different ways. And I completely agree with what you're saying, but I feel like so many people when it comes to restructuring capitalism they always focus on you know those 401ks or the houses the things that like 40 50 percent of people have when in actuality what everybody wants is for that extremely small people who are billionaires 
They want those people to pay more money. They want those people to give more, to not have situations where Netflix makes a profit and doesn't pay any taxes, or Amazon makes a profit and doesn't pay any taxes, or Jeff Bezos has more money than 50% of Americans or something crazy like that. Like th those are the people, not the, the millionaires yeah. or the small businesses or the people, you know, mom and pop shops who did good, or, you know, the people who have two or 3 million, like those aren't the people we're talking about we're talking about the extreme extreme examples of wealth and what blows my mind about it is is it, it, it's a testament to the efficacy of the of the propaganda the, the tactics that were used to like perpetuate that sort of a thing where people would go to bat for things that are actively hurt them um right. like, I, I, it's like, like why are you voting just, for this it's gonna hurt you <laughs> yeah because well, even if you look at it just on a on a just a practical level like if you have if you have um pen a and pen b and pen a has like x amount of item and pen b has y amount of item and the y amount is bigger than the x amount of item well you can't get as much out of x as you can y so why would you expect more to come out of x than y right. it just it, <laughs> like it just makes no sense to me like why people would be opposed to that when it's like so blatantly obvious like when you put it in simple terms like that yeah the one that always frust frustrates me to the moon is the word socialism how some people perceive that to be like marxist leninist communism and other people hear socialism and they're like oh like that's just capitalism with some bumper guards on it and some regulation and it's but people hear the exact same term and completely have different opinions on on what it means and yeah, that, that term always just like super upsets me to no end that we can be having a conversation and say that magic S word and some people think you're going to turn us into Soviet Union and other people are are just like, well, what about Norway? You know, it's like whenever the whole conversation comes up, there's people who are like, well, look at the Scandinavian countries and how they handle economics versus and then the other side will be like, well, look at Venezuela and how they're handling economics. And it's like totally different situations different scenarios the nuance is being lost it's all a gray area it's not black or white but everybody just loves throwing black and white answers it's really frustrating dangerous a dangerous question maybe i shouldn't ask it but <laughs> i'm open what what, what would you identify as political i guess political uh, philosophy and uh, economic philosophy i guess um i'm extremely extremely independent and i very much despise in the united states the two-party system that we have um like apps like i can't say confidently i would either vote for either um but yeah just extremely independent i'd say economically i mean probably more on that like I, I i do see a lot of the great benefits that capitalism has brought to society but there's just been such a myriad of of terrible things that's done as well so i just i feel like a good system would be the pros of capitalism with the bumper guards of socialism in there to help alleviate a lot of the the shortcomings of it um but i, I mean I, I i'm very progressive in the sense when it comes to individual liberties and people just wanting to i don't know it's like this weird combination of like progressive social libertarianism i guess because i also think people should be able to live their life however they want to live as long as they're not harming anybody as long as they're not affecting anybody else in you know a harmful way and they're over the age of their 18 age of consent do whatever you want to do it's all good in a sense um so I don't know. I don't know if that's quite a specific answer on the mark. Cause I mean, I just, oh, listen, that's all right. I listen to everything. Like I, I always try to listen to stuff that I think I would disagree with. And I've listened to really conservative people who I absolutely love and really progressive people who I absolutely love and people in the middle who find both sides and can, you know, find good chunks between the two of them. Um, Cause I think there's, there's great arguments for a lot of things on, on all sides of the spectrum um and just the the difficulty is like where do we bring them together you know how far left do some ideas go how far right do some ideas go like where is the the middle ground and that's a huge frustration in politics is it seems like a lot of times those compromises aren't for the good of anyone except corporations and 
the pockets of their donors. And it's also weird in a sense, because I feel like sometimes systems could probably work better if there almost weren't compromises. Like it'd be really fascinating if we could ever get to a point where we have like a supercomputer and can run actual simulations, like real in-depth simulations of stuff to see what a very, very pure capitalist economy civilization would be like, you know, or a very progressive social type system, like what that would truly be like. And I mean, we have some around the world, you know, like Singapore, Hong Kong, United States, and then you have like Scandinavian countries for more of like a social socialism kind of perspective. But it would be just fascinating to see, to be able to tweak all these different codes in there and just be like, well, what if we did this? And we could see it before we implement it. Cause everybody's scared if we're going to try something new that it's going to fail. Like everybody's always scared of failure. And sometimes, I mean, we have to try something different and it to fail, but everybody, if something ever fails, then they just point the finger and it was like, it was actually your administration that did it. Or this failure is uh, that oh God. it's the pointing the finger game. And like, who cares? We just got to fix it and get over with it and learn from it and that is not a highlight of our political system in in 2021 um, and that and that thing there about the finger pointing kind of accentuates like the 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 quality the lack of quality of education uh, whether intentional or not um that's a whole other thing but um but yeah like like listen i, I do think that'd be an interesting idea the whole simulation thing you're talking about being able to to simulate it now one thing that could be an issue there is trying to translate because like in that system you'd be going i'm assuming in the hypotheticals you'd be you know having if you're wanting to see a purely capitalistic thing and how that would work if it would be have to be built up like it was always like that just to see like what mm. the ideal state would be and then you would have to figure out how to translate that into our situation now well, because like what we have now is not a purely capitalist thing if it was social security wouldn't exist right yeah, Firefighters wouldn't exist those kinds of things right um or you could yeah, even try both a, you could try a ton of different ideas right like from today it would be pretty cool yeah um I, have you played the game bioshock i have not but i have the titles i've always meant to go check them out i i've i've watched like some playthrough stuff of it because i was like i have no idea when i'm ever going to be able to get to Oh, it's, it, um, the reason I bring it up is because the very first game kind of the whole idea of I won't spoil anything but like a big component of it was this idea of um, people running away from a government system trying to build their own society their own utopia their own world and have a very capitalistic type society where anything goes essentially and it did not turn out very good that's where the kind of the whole game and everything comes from but it's it's a uh, it's very fascinating because i mean i i totally agree there's just there are a lot of shortcomings when it comes to both sides and 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 even maybe philosophies we haven't even haven't even thought of yet like maybe there's some something better than socialism something better than capitalism maybe there's something we haven't even thought of yet but if we're just so stuck in our ways and shoving our feet in the ground like no it has to be capitalism it's the american way if we just think like that like nothing's nothing's ever going to progress forward and we're never going to learn anything i would think there's a very good possibility that something better than capitalism exists yeah. especially seeing how post-capitalism has gone now now granted in the usa that that's that the combination of that with legal bribery and what that whole thing brings but um i i um I had a train of thought and the ring light has fried my brains and I, I lost it. It was gone. But uh ah shit. Yeah, I I I can't remember where I was going with that. Just basically that um Yeah, no, it's totally gone. I don't remember. No, you're good, you're good. Oh um, one question like a little bit different from that, but one I would love to hear your perspective on is what are your thoughts on consciousness? Consciousness. Oh, well, that's a good one. Are you tapping into the uh, philosophical a, debate that you were having before that I wanted to, I, I was lurking when you were having it and I wanted to be able to chime in, but I wasn't able to. Um, that's so a I'm deep glad one asked. right there. Um, consciousness. Well, I mean, based on what we know so far, it would seem to be something that is a, a, um, a result of our uh, organic computer, essentially, like the physiological 
um, no. interactions that happen there. And like a, a big reason why I'm kind of on a very naturalistic viewpoint when it comes to that sort of a thing is uh, like, look at strokes, for example, like if someone has a stroke, it can alter their personality and and alter their cognitive functioning and things like that. And so if consciousness had some other aspect to it besides just like what our brains do, you would think there'd be some sort of bypass to that sort of a thing or something to where it would either have a, a, a more negligible effect or it wouldn't end up having an effect at all. But since it has such a dramatic effect or it can have such a dramatic effect, that would lend credence to the idea of like a purely naturalistic kind of explanation for it. Kind of thinking more of just like the neurons firing with each other versus some spiritual soul or something else. Yeah, yeah, essentially. And um, it, it's it's interesting that I've kind of gone to that sort of a thing because like I grew up as a Christian, so I didn't always have like I was a Christian for like 20 years of my life. So I definitely didn't have that kind of mentality about it, consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for a while and then that's changed now that i'm atheist so it's you know yeah i've i've i also grew up in a very christian household and i mean i don't i don't know i mean i probably say more on the agnostic side because there is this sense of like i i feel like i want there to be something more and i feel like there's so much that humans might not ever be able to understand like this this entirety of the universe out there how everything is so structured and beautifully created and there's just chaos and order everywhere and i just think like you know maybe my little monkey brain was not ever created in a sense to be able to truly comprehend the gravity and scope of of the entirety of the universe um but yeah in a sense like i don't know there's something beautiful i see i see both sides of it like i see how some people find that reverence of you know when they pass away when they die there's something beyond there's a soul there's a heaven there's something uh, an afterlife but i've i've listened to richard dawkins a couple times and he the way he talks about like when you die and there is truly nothing afterwards like in his sense there is something almost beautiful in it as well because that means just the time that you're alive whether it's one minute longer you know a day a week a year, 10 years, a hundred years, however long all of us have, that's the most important time in the world. And we have to make the most out of it. And I don't know, life can be as grand as we want it to be, or it could not be grand at all. Maybe we're just, we are like monkeys on this crazy ass planet in a, just a little corner of the galaxy in one of many galaxies in a huge super cluster. And like, we don't matter at all. And in that sense, the only matter that truly matters is the matter we find in each other and the matter that we find in our own life so i don't know there's something grand and almost magnetic about that sense of you know when you die that's it nothing nothing else consciousness is just neurons firing you know there's nothing afterwards so I, personally i i kind of i i i don't know i just I've always, I've always grappled with that idea of like, if there is nothing after death, I just always feel like I want there to be something, maybe not even a heaven or a hell or anything like I can experience, but maybe something like, and, and even the more I dive into like simulation theory, I feel like maybe that could be a thing, you know, some creator, some, someone at their computer game in another universe playing Stardew Valley or Sims or whatever. And we're, <laughs> we're the characters in that. But I don't know. What are what are your thoughts on simulation theory? And do you think like I mean, that could be a thing? It's interesting. It's an interesting thing to to contemplate. Uh, I mean, as far as like simulation theory would be concerned, I mean, un unless we were able to find some sort of hypothetical crack in the seams, there's no real way that we'd be able to know whether right. that's the case or not. So it's like an interesting thought experiment to have. Now, granted, we might come across some discovery later on that completely throws that wide open and. And I mean, that's happened before with other different fields of studies. I mean, at one time, the volcanoes erupting or lightning storms happening were thought to be the acts of gods. And then, you know, we, once scientific progress got to the point where we were able to know what actually causes those things that, you know, blew those fields wide open, um, I think like it, germ theory, for example. I think it, Dawkins has said something. Sorry to interrupt, but like on oh, that, um, one of my favorite things 
thing one of my favorite things he has said before is like it's always the power of god until science discovers it's not god <laughs> so you know it, it's almost like the supernatural thing that we just don't understand you know maybe like center of a black hole or just things like that are just beyond the human mind the the science comprehension at the moment you know that some people say it's the act of god and and there's just waiting to be science to take take leeway if you will i'm sorry what were you saying though i'm sorry oh that's good that's just that that's uh that's a thing known as the god of the gaps um well fallacy basically of like being like oh well we can't explain it currently therefore god when it's like well it doesn't necessarily require that sort of a thing it might just be that we're not aware of what, what causes those mechanisms yet we might find out later on um or maybe yeah maybe so maybe there is something. And, and that's even like with the thing of talking about like created and stuff like that well that would presuppose that there would even need to be creation or like a creator to begin with when that might not necessarily be the case at all um one thing that's interesting rna there actually have been um i think this was within within the last few years or something like that but like scientists have been able to successfully um have rna self-replicate into simple organisms like simple cell single cell organisms and then go from there so basically the idea is that rna which then becomes the building blocks for dna rna can self-replicate and within the right conditions can self-replicate uh to the point of having mutations happen to where it begins to develop life uh, essentially um so which therefore would mean a, a that's kind of evidence in favor of uh or in support of not necessarily needing to have a creator that life can find a way when the right building blocks come together right right it's it's always that's always one of the very interesting ideas is like how did we go from a planet being bombarded by asteroids like a lava field of a planet with no atmosphere <laughs> and then all of a sudden we have octopuses and whales and mosquitoes and humans and and everything that we see nowadays it's such a fascinating it's just so fascinating with all that i mean even in the sense like maybe the idea of time is just totally dependent on the universe that we live in and maybe i mean i i don't think any of us know any of us will ever truly know but you know maybe there could be somebody behind that snap of a finger maybe they're turning their computer on and that's the big bane that like sends it all out you know um who knows but yeah i mean if we, if we can't ever test it if we can never test a simulation theory or a multiverse theory or a god theory i mean it's it's hard to it's hard to spend more time in that than just the the mindless beer chatter with friends you know yeah now there are certain fields that are able to um have stronger support for things like uh like for example like well trying to figure out like how life originated and things like that that's mm -hmm. a field that's a abiogenesis that's that sort of thing but then there's the theory of evolution which is um essentially boils down to being a theory of explaining species differentiation through natural selection and mutation right. and um one thing that is a, a pet peeve of mine <laughs> is when i hear that it's just a theory thing because that that it's reinforcing uh, a lack in quality of education because like when people commonly use the word theory, they mean like an educated guess or like a guess, and that's not what theory means like in the scientific theory. definition sense. It's a very different thing. Right. Um, the hypothesis would be more accurate to like an educated guess, whatever thing. Essentially, you'd be saying, I'm predicting that if we're doing this experiment, this is what we'll see. And that would be a hypothesis. Um, so you have... Kind of like gravity. So a like theory, we can measure a theory gravity, is like the right? highest what's that kind of like gravity like we can measure gravity we know gravity is a thing it is like your opinions on it have no matter at all gravity is real like that's a, like the theory of gravity right yeah yeah the um theory of gravity the uh theory of relativity is a, an explanation because the theory basically is a body of um of evidence that supports a particular type of explanation for a phenomenon and uh evolution is in fact the the, the most like it, it ha is a theory that has the strongest body of evidence for it even more so than germ theory and like the theory of relativity and things like that so if you want to go about like a theory like evolution is as close to being proven to well it is in the colloquial sense of like proven fact like if you're looking at a, at a court of law like evolution would be proven beyond dispute like it would yeah. be backed to 
to the satisfaction of any sort of court of law, essentially. Um, that is how much evidence is there for that sort of a thing. Um, that and sense. then, oh, go ahead, go ahead. It's that, do you think it's just that human selfishness in us where we just cannot fathom us being nothing special whatsoever and we're just like a, a, a mutation, an evolution of you know apes and monkeys down the line and we're just are what we are now and there's it's hard to say it but there's like nothing in a very broad sense there's nothing special about us we're just here because of natural selection and evolution and and it's just our time in the universe at the moment um, well yeah and to be clear we, we didn't it. evolve from apes we are apes i mean we right. we had a common ancestor but like we have different cousin species that like we are part of the apes right. family essentially right. but but uh but yeah no i i do think that plays a factor uh of like that wanting to be special and 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 um wanting to not be considered i guess an animal or for because for whatever reason that's like this horrible thing which that's something that i find kind of amusing the whole insult of like oh treating them like they're an animal it's like well we are an animal like right i mean there's even like evidence i believe that like other animals have consciousness and you know other animals i was just listening to this the other day like there are animals that like mate for pleasure not for mm -hmm. the purpose of procreating or creating offspring like they do it because they enjoy it which is like oh you always think that's a human thing but no there are other animals in the animal kingdom that do that other animals that have consciousness like it's it's we're just we're just another animal on the planet and and for better or for worse we are the most dominant and and powerful of all the animals in the animal kingdom and have completely transformed this entire planet and changed it for the better for us and arguably for the worse for the rest of the planet um Badly, yeah 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 it's 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 hard to let go of that eagle self that ego within all of us that, you know, we are special and, you know, we were created by a creator in, in their image and we're supposed to be here. And when in actuality, it's just the time period in the universe that we're in. It's, it's just, this is your slice of human time and we might evolve into aliens. I mean, the whole idea, you know, we were like really big and muscular before and hairy, and now we're becoming smaller, less hairy, bigger brains, bigger head. You know, maybe in the future we have we're even smaller beings, even more frail, and just have even bigger heads. So the whole argument of like aliens or something. Yeah, yeah, and that would all depend on the cellular structure too. Because like one thing with evolution is that there are new traits that can come up, but like humans wouldn't be able to develop reptilian features, like or, or like certain reptilian features, for example, because that would be there are limits to like the evolutionary mutations that can happen um now one thing that's interesting there is uh when you were mentioning about the the pleasure and stuff i was just thinking of like the different stuff because yeah dolphins species of dolphins they're they're ones the ones that you know have, have sex for pleasure and then um like elephants have elaborate mourning um rituals that they do uh chimpanzees have been shown to uh exhibit regret over actions like they look they can look over their past lives and or the their past and be like man i regret not doing this thing like they've they've been shown to be able to have that concept um you have crows like species of corvids they're probably the most intelligent bird species or like the bird i guess not species it'd be the bird genus out there corvid the genus corvid yeah um like there's there there's one species that because of their need to be able to have tools they've developed the ability to make tools like they can bend things into hooks and and use them to grab stuff they've was it chimpanzees um, there's some species that did of that? was it chimpanzees that did that they'd like create tools for f finding food was it chimps or orangutans or oh, chimps chimps uh chimps use tools there's actually been some chimp uh uh groups that have shown quite some advanced tool making like spears level like advanced to tool making but um yeah with the corvids the one thing that's cool is that all, um there was a video that i had seen where it was showing them doing like advanced um like advanced thinking skills they were able to plan and think several steps ahead to like figure out uh, a puzzle would involve them getting like a, a a stick initially to then reach in and grab a pebble 
to then drop it into this one thing to have the one stick come out to grab this other stick thing to then let them get the food and they were able to like go through all that stuff and it took them like three minutes if that to to, to figure out the thing um so showing that level of intelligence there's been some studies that have demonstrated that crows uh um can uh like basically there was a study done where the person would like put on a mask and would like harass the crows like nothing like horrible just like it was distressing to them but like they didn't do anything that would be harmful or anything like that to them but um the crows would make these specific calls and like reckon uh, like th- things that were like warning calls whenever someone with that mask came around like imposter and then what they were doing was they were seeing if they would learn that and then they would pass that information on to future generations and so then they came back whenever the the parent crows would have been deceased or like they went to a different area like they followed the offspring and then went a couple generations and then put on the masks again and they immediately started warning everyone else which showed that they passed on what they learned wow uh, yeah it's really cool that is science is awesome science is awesome I've, i you know as i've kind of grown older and i've shed a lot of my like christian beliefs and kind of stem more on that like agnostic side i i always think to myself like i feel like science is my religion you know the idea that like something is you have to prove it unequivocally without a shadow of a doubt like this has to be proven factual just resonates so well with me like something that like we all universally can accept as fact and not have an opinion on like like gravity you know like we all accept that gravity is real gravity is real it's it's undisputed um and just in that sense like i i I almost think science is my religion in some in some crazy way the only thing with that though is like science like it's with religion perfect. that would require belief in like a typically requires belief in some sort of like spiritual other being and that wouldn't necessarily be the case with science with science there's like the the um the uh, scientific method you know testing hypotheses seeing if if the hypothesis is supported and if so further testing to like identify specific other mechanisms within if not either revising the hypothesis or discarding it and testing something else because like with with scientific explanations they never actually like you can do causation like you know cause and effect and and establishing that but even then scientists will never state something as being like ah this is proven true it's simply that the preponderance of evidence supports this point like a, a hypothesis like or, or something can always be proven wrong but it can't be proven true because the idea behind it is is that would limit um our curiosity or like our, our or like we would be like oh yes we know that this is how it is when there might be some other facet to it we hadn't considered or hadn't realized that would do give a even clearer explanation for how something works uh, yeah i feel like a good example is um like the theory of relativity and like the the physics of the big of the universe don't fully mesh all the way with the physics of the small when it comes to quantum so that's where the whole theory of everything comes in and string theory and kind of diving into that realm of trying to find what connects quantum mechanics to you know the theory of relativity and the scope of the universe the scope of galaxies and black holes and how just everything functions in its own way um because yeah the theory of small and the theory of big don't exactly mesh together they don't connect there's they're still looking for something to connect them or maybe it really could be something we've all believed before maybe the theory of relativity is wrong in some ways it'd be weird because there's so many things that kind of add up to align with it but yeah, I think when you just say hundred something's a hundred percent, even if it's ninety nine point nine 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 percent true, there's always that what if, right? Well, and there might be there might be the day where like a better theory kind of t- builds on the foundation of relativity, but better explains a phenomenon. And right. if that's the case, then what would happen to it would be what happened to Isaac Newton's theory of gravity, which was something that was a foundational building block. But when theory of relativity could explain better what was happening, then that theory of gravity was discarded, remembered for its contribution, but ultimately discarded because that explanation with theory of relativity was better than than the previous one. And one thing I love with the theory of relativity and like what it looks at is like the impact of gravity on time space. It's just something that I always find fascinating and just awe inspiring because basically the idea is that the 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 when the the more intense gravitational forces are and also has to do with philosophy velocity as well so like the faster you travel the slower time 
proceeds and then also like the the more intense the gravity is the slower time proceeds it's it's just fascinating um interstellar well spoilers for a movie that's been out for a while have you seen interstellar i don't want to give yes. a spoiler for yes. yes okay so it's an extreme example of it but it is how it, w- it would work if that sort of an extreme thing could be run into but basically the idea so for interstellar there is the thing where the planet they go to that's on near the event horizon of a black hole which is the point of no return essentially like right. if you cross the event horizon of a black hole there's no escape you're you're gonna get spaghettified as they call it eventually right. um but with with that planet they go down to the planet to pick, check out a signal, but the planet, the gravitational forces are so strong that an hour there essentially would equate to, what was it, seven years right, on Earth, yeah. something like that. Seven years. And so something happens and they end up being stuck down there a little bit longer than what they intended to be. So by the time they come back to the ship, 23 years of Earth time has gone by. Right. So the guy that stayed on the ship to like observe and study the stuff, experienced 23 earth years going by and, and and was older than they were when they came back and he was around their same age when they left right and for the people that went down that planet a couple hours went by for them and that was it and so like the guy who was down there when he comes back he sees his daughter who is his age now and then like eventually towards the end his daughter becomes older than him because right. of the stuff that happened and it's just it's so cool to like think about obviously that would be like a horrible situation to live through but like just the fact that that could even be a thing potentially is just it's mind-blowing it even happens to a lesser degree on the satellites above us because the satellites in space are have a little bit different gravity pull than us standing on earth if you were to go up there spend time up there and then come down your watch would tick at a different time pace than someone on earth so yep yep and that's that's how they were able to pr- give support to einstein's uh, thought experiment regarding that was when they put uh two atomic clocks and one of them was put on an airplane that was flying around and the other one was like i think it was on like a a, a vehicle that was moving or something but not nearly at the same speed so when they came back the clock that was in the airplane was slower than the clock that was you know on earth on the car yeah um space is incredibly fascinating literally like my favorite thing to, to do is to go to sleep at night like watching a space documentary or just anything with space i'm incredibly intrigued with it um and yeah the way like space we perceive space in like a, a 3d plane of distance but really there's a fourth dimension of time integrated as well that's why it's called the space time continuum the whole idea that something very heavy gravitational base can just get plopped into the middle of a a group of stars a group of planets and it can change massively the time scale on it Um, like if we were to replace our sun with an equally sized like physically dimensional size like black hole um just our time and relativity and everything would be i mean we probably get pulled right into it which wouldn't be good but (laughs) yeah um but yeah even that like is so fascinating the sense that you can have the exact same if if we replaced our sun with an equally sized mass black hole it would be so incredibly small we probably would struggle to even see it but our everything would still circle as it normally does i mean we'd be freezing ass cold and (laughs) that would suck but yeah like it's so fascinating i've always i've always wondered with black holes why they're called black holes because i've always thought they were just a black star that was so gravitation kind of like neutron stars they're essentially just a more powerful neutron star and they're so intensely gravitationally based that they're sucking in light as well I've always wondered why they call them black holes and not black stars. I think that's just like a naming thing because initially yeah. it looked like a hole. And then now granted, there's no way to for us to know for sure what it's like inside of there. We just know that they're extremely dense. And I guess based, based on like advanced mathematical computations and like certain things that are observed, like the little ring light thing that happens around a black hole because mm-hmm. it's literally warping the way we are observing the light that's happening because the gravitational forces are so strong that they're strong enough that light won't escape right a a black hole so like light which i cannot remember the speed at the top of my head but it's very very fast the fastest it cannot outrun the impact of of the the gravity that's the gravitational forces that are happening so and even if you could somehow be in a ship that could travel at the speed of light 
space is so damn big that it would still take years, actual years to just go next door to our next door neighbor. Alpha Centauri, I think is like four light years away. So if you could travel at the speed, the fastest known speed our physics understands, it would still take you four years to get there. And we do not have anything that can travel at the speed of light. And what's really cool with that is when you stop and think about it, then what the stars that you see in the sky, yes. what you are seeing is not what is currently up there. So Past. like, um, what is it? Beetlejuice, the, the one star in Orion's belt or something like that. Or are like, you supernova? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say um, what we see of it. I want to say it's far enough away that what we're seeing is actually what was there 2000 years ago. Yeah. So like so like what is actually going on there is completely different from what we're seeing. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> oh, okay, I, I didn't know if you had a ticket, but um, yeah, so like what we what we see up in the sky, the different stars that we see, those stars, what we are witnessing is what they were like at however long it took for light to get to us. So even like the sun, for example, it takes it would at the speed of light, this light that's coming from the sun takes eight minutes approximately yep. to to reach us. So what we are seeing is what the sun looks like eight minutes ago, technically. Right. Isn't that just so it's so weird to think about because like if you're traveling to the grocery store you don't it, yeah it, it's not time based like that so it's such a, a foreign weird thing for us to think about but th that's just how powerful gravity is how powerful space is how huge space is um, oh yeah that that time literally is warped around gravity and it's so fascinating but yeah the the idea that you look at stars all throughout our galaxy and it's seven years ago for that one 30 years for that one 200 years for that one you know there's stars on the other side that are hundreds of thousands of years i mean i always i feel like that's just such a core push as to why i believe like there has to be some kind of alien life out there i, I mean i feel very confident that there is single cell alien life probably in our own solar system probably europa titan mars there's there's got to be some kind of single cell life i wouldn't be surprised but like actual <clears throat> intelligent life even if it's incredibly low like 0.00001 percent chance like there are what i think 200,000 light years across our entire milky way galaxy and billions of stars and billions of planets and just the odds are there that there's got to be something maybe they're not galactic empire yet taking over the galaxy because i feel like we might have seen that but even then we've only been observing with telescopes what the past 300 years 400 years and if our galaxy is 200 000 light years across we've only really observed like a small chunk of it there could be galactic federation 2000 light years away and it's going to take us another 1500 years before we can even observe that well, and that's just our galaxy. There could right. be something in a, a whole other galaxy, and that's adding a whole bunch even more distance. I, I think the statistics, looking at statistics and probability, I would say it's almost certain that there would have to be some other form of life out there. But it's just as likely that we may never cross paths because of just how vast space is. Right. Right. I, I feel like if, if we are going to travel to other planets or, or colonize the galaxy or anything like that in the future, it, there has to be something maybe like star trek based like a warp system where we essentially create a wormhole from point a to point b and travel there because if if it really comes down to traveling at the speed of light that's just not going to do it you know or it's going to take incredibly long amount of time um and yeah i mean I, I think a wormhole or some kind of way to uncover that it just is hopefully going to be the future yeah that's such a deep deep conversation in and of itself because yeah i mean we can't even get to other planets in our solar system and put humans there and and then we're thinking about our next door neighbor stars we're thinking about our galaxies you know other galaxies like andromeda right next right next door two million light years away right next door <laughs> but then even the super clusters you know we're, we're like i don't know it's like a neighborhood you know we're like one little house and then of a neighborhood of a town of a city of a state and it just keeps going bigger and bigger and bigger um it's so fascinating mm -hmm. that's why that's why i feel like that's what's kind of holding me back a little bit from being full-blown atheist and there is a little bit of agnostic in there because like I'm, I'm so on board with all science and everything like this but i just wonder if there is somebody right before the big bang who snapped their finger 
and something happened and maybe the idea of time and creation for them is a totally different concept to us because because naturally as humans we would be like but what was before the big bang maybe that's not even a real question to ask because what started time what started our entire clock ticking forward was the big bang so there isn't anything before i mean maybe there is maybe it's a series of big expansions and contracting and big expansions again and have you thought about that idea like the whole expanding universe crunching down expanding again i mean i I, I'm kind of interested in the idea of like a, a, a distortion opening up um, from like a different dimension and like multiverse, you know, giving that sort of like genesis that that like basically putting the building blocks in place essentially because like it, it would you know thinking about like oh could a creator have done this and it's like well I mean it's just as likely that this thing could have happened. Right. Um, and if anything, if there was a creator, it would have to, at least based on what we currently know, like scientifically, it would definitely seem like it would be a more of like a a deist sort of thing of like putting the initial stuff in place and then being more hands off with stuff because nothing else really would kind of make sense with that. And, and then one thing's interesting, too, with like atheism and like the agnostic thing, because like atheism really kind of is just like not being convinced of any sort of specific like deity or like not having the belief in any sort of like religion or, or anything like that so like off of, off of that grounds if you if you have that philosophy of not being convinced of any of that sort of a thing then you would be atheist by definition because like the agnostic thing ha has to do with like not knowing because that's what the term like mean means yeah. originally so not knowing about certain aspects whereas like the atheist or theism has to do with like belief as opposed to knowledge right so that, that's just my philosophy Right, right. And I mean, do you think in the sense atheism is more like, I don't, is it just the belief that there is nothing after death versus just like, I'm just whatever these other religions throughout the world are, I'm definitely not that. But I don't know, I, there could be something, would that be more agnostic in a sense, do you think? Like, I'm none of these, but I just don't know. Well, I, I think it's looking at two different aspects of, of things i guess it would be the way i would put it because i don't know i'm not doing a very good job of explaining no you're explaining good. These what are, I'm thinking. yeah um but, but basically like like atheism would be like belief in a god so or theism would be a belief in a god so atheism means not no belief in a god so right. like if you don't believe that there would be a god or like a god would exist or that kind of a thing or at least are convinced based on the evidence that's available that it seems like that that's not the case then you would be atheist now granted there are people that can be atheist and not have that sort of like scientific view on it because like atheism is just lacking belief in like any sort of theism so like you could have all kinds of philosophies and you know be atheist so there, there's atheists that would be humanists i i would consider myself humanist and there's a term called epistivist, which basically means that you don't think very fondly on the concept of religion. You 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 don't think it's very good for humanity, and that 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 is kind of where I settle on in the sense of like there's a lot of observations of or there's a lot of repeated incidents recorded in history showing like atrocities done in the name of religion, so that kind of a thing, like. Would I, especially in, in like the counseling context, would I ever like try to actively dissuade a client from a particular religion? Absolutely not. That would be incredibly inappropriate. Um, if, if they were, if they had unhealthy views about themselves that were informed because of a religious thing, I would explore that and see if there's like some sort of different interpretation they could take because they're 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 processing something harmful about themselves. So like that would need to change. But like. I'm not going to be like, oh, you're stupid for thinking, you know, I'm not going to, that right, would be right, an extreme right. example, but I'm not going to actively like try to get someone to not believe in whatever faith or whatever that they have. Cause I just think that would, that would be unethical right. for me to do so. I, I mean, I think even there's a lot of really good things in, in religion. There are many different religions, a lot of good moral beliefs, a lot of good, like good ways of thinking, treat your neighbors well, treat other humans well, just be a good human. Um, and I think a big problem comes in when humans, when humans grab onto this and they see like a power grab, they create a, a religion around it. They create a, a structure of there's 
not i don't want to i don't like a pope or, or just like a leader in charge of a specific thing that just oversees and it becomes almost more of like a corporation with a religious philosophy but it's not really fully realized because there's so many caveats and asterisks and like well except for this except for this except for this we're going to protect our people for this and it, yeah i feel like there's a lot of good philosophical wise that can come from religion but like organized religion that's kind of where I, I i see i get frustrated a lot with it um and i mean even the sense like what are your thoughts on people in olden days maybe using psychedelic substances to perceive these visions of this god figure of this creator and like if you think about it i mean i feel like psychedelics could have a big part of how religions came to be because i mean back in the day i mean they just knew that if they ate this they would see the light of god and to them they probably were really seeing something incredibly potent and they're just like you know to their their leaders their kings their queens like take the substance and god will speak to you and that really did happen um because it had such a profound impact on, on them mentally and i it's it's more plausible to see how these stories and these these philosophies and these you know book of revelations kind of things came to be when you do factor in maybe they were taking mushrooms or burning ayahuasca plants or something i would say it would almost certainly be the case of like what what had happened or like at least there's a good chance that that was what happened in a lot of cases um well even like the 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 um oh the seers and in in, in in greek for, or grecian stuff for example they you know they were in caves and they essentially were huffing fumes coming right. out of there and it was making them hot right <laughs> right so the, the, there's that and then um well, is that the one where they oh, go like to it, like uh is that the one where they'd go to like a priestess to ask for like wisdom and when they went in there it was just fumes that would get them all like super high so she would give like very specific or like very interesting advice or very philosophical yeah. wisdom but they're all just like baked out of their mind on who knows what and they're of course yeah like the oracles in the caves yeah 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 and i mean like it, true it's it's like truly they are seeing stuff and they are going inwards and seeing you know these dragons or these beings or these godheads or these magnificent things but that's so much more to do with like the substance that they took rather than a spiritual deity maybe contacting them you know yeah and the and the the thoughts can come from that and it could also just come from like a lack of understanding of how things work then because like there's there's certain passages uh, there's a passage in the in the old testament that has to do with like when it was talking about them following the the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire and that's likely referencing a volcano like so they were seeing like a volcanic eruption and so that's what they were right. were following and then there's like the when it talks about Adam being formed out of clay and stuff that was what they called a golem spell then like you know animating clay so mud golems animating mud golems essentially yeah is what humans were. I mean I think even some yeah, uh, I think even some scientists in like Jerusalem I believe like found evidence for the acacia bush being there which is very rich in DMT and they believe that maybe that's what happened with Moses when he climbed Mount uh, I can't remember the mountain that he climbed, but essentially climbed the mountain to get the new test or to get the, the 10 commandments and was burning the burning bush essentially and releasing all this DMT fumes and having the most outstanding trip of his lifetime, essentially. Um, and God really <laughs> was speaking to him in a sense, you know, give, <laughs> but it, it's, it, if you think of it, like in that sense, like all these really weird, interesting religious spiritual tales and then when you combine in like what people have experienced from psychedelic substances it's not hard to put two and two together you know yeah now with the the case with moses i imagine that would have influenced like the mythology there and the reason why i'm saying mythology is because like apparently the general consensus now and this is coming from like rabbinical scholars and things like that as well is that uh moses was very likely a myth of like different collected tales so like basically he wouldn't have been a historical figure he never would have existed like the whole story that happened then would have been like a, an oral mythology that would have been passed down and then like transcribed later so yeah i've heard some people say that as well about jesus like 
possibly Jesus was maybe just a one individual prophet of many just kind of going around preaching good things. Maybe it was like a culmination of a couple collective individuals. Um, who knows? There's, there's, there's not really any substantial hard evidence that points in any which way direction. Well, there were a lot of, um, Yeshua's that went around the day, like, I guess doing different stuff or whatever. Cause Yeshua also is, was a common name, like a, a common name, like a Jewish name there. Cause it was, it was named after like Joshua in the Bible. Cause like Jesus was like a, 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 a Greek transliteration, I guess, of like Yeshua, Joshua essentially. So like Jesus would have actually been Joshua or like Yeshua would have been the closer names for yeah. it. I, I, I love talking about stuff like this from a not in a particular religious mindset to like just kind of being on the outside and talking about this is it's so fascinating um because like i i understand where like humans come from wanting a savior figure wanting something to relieve them from their suffering um even to this day i mean and it, way back when you are they had way worse living conditions and much less uh you know time to be alive and lifespans and everything so like i understand where they're coming from but it's just it's always humans go in there and create this power vacuum of of corruption and yeah humans a lot of times what humans touch doesn't exactly turn to gold shall we say yeah yeah sadly right um if you could, um, so a couple other questions I have, cause I know we're kind of running a little bit over it. Oh, I fine, just noticed fine. that. Um, so a couple questions I did want to ask you as well, a little bit more on the streaming side of things. If you sure. could tap, uh, if you could time travel as we're just talking about time traveling <laughs> with relativity, uh -huh. if you could time travel and go in the past and tell your day one streaming self, one solid piece of streaming advice, do you have anything you'd say to yourself? Oh, that's a good question. There's a, there's some stuff that I've contemplated over, but now now I'm kind of like drawing a blank for what I'd want to answer. But like, there's definitely stuff I'd want to say. Uh, I think, I I think, hmm. Because I'm trying to think now, because there's been like different stages where I've like thought like different things are what I've kind of like focused on. So like, I guess I could kind of start there and maybe fine tune my answer. But um. One of the, one of the things was, um, I guess, kind of like trust your gut with, uh, I, I never really did the whole follow for follow or gun and that sort of a thing, but th yeah. there, there, there was a, a group of, of folks who like, when I was interacting with them at first, there was, there was really good people there. And some of the people I still know and interact with now, um, but they were definitely part of a follow follow community and that was like giving off them vibes and I was kind of suspecting it. Yeah. But I was like, okay, maybe I'm just being too paranoid because sometimes I'm like that. So I was like, let me just give the benefit of the doubt. So I'd be like in those sort of situations, trust your gut because you're right <laughs> in that situation. Follow for follow um, is so I weird. I guess another thing would oh. be, um, I, I guess with like the gear, I don't know, like just better because I'm trying to remember the specific example that triggered this for me and it's not coming to my mind, but basically the, there are times where like I could have spent the money better. Like I tried to research into the stuff and then like some weird thing just came out of nowhere and it was like, oh yes, no, this actually was useless because of this. And even though I tried to like, you know, make myself aware of all the different things that I needed to know for it, this little obscure thing just kind of threw a wrench into everything. So I guess sometimes just being a little bit... I don't even want to say cautious with money because I was being like really cautious about it. I guess just there there's an example that happened where I think I kind of like jumped the gun a little bit. And I guess in that situation being like, ah, you don't really need to necessarily worry about that kind of stuff, I guess. I sound like I'm kind of rambling at this point. I feel no, like I am anyway. Hopefully that makes sense. I um I, I, I guess the biggest thing would be just the not comparing thing, though, I guess. Um, because I, I was worse with that before. I've gotten better with it now. There, there's other aspects to it that I kind of struggle with now. It's it mainly more so of like the finding the balance of being like, okay, when am I when am I trying to like take inspiration or when is it like healthy motivation and when is it being unhealthy stuff? And sometimes it's hard to tell. And uh, so that's kind of like what I I guess deal with now. But 
Yeah, I know that's a lot of stuff for a, a question. I just was having a hard time getting to the answer, so I guess that's the answer that I'll go with. Oh, you're totally good. You're totally good. Um, a couple points on that. Yeah, I, I definitely think um, follower for follower mentality. I've always found that so odd because like followers don't really like the follower count the number doesn't really matter at all on twitch because like it's all like what's what twitch really sees is like the most important metrics um definitely is like average viewerships and then just like money being brought into to twitch so yeah like the whole follower number or i think i i think the follower number is fun for like a a fun stream or hey we hit a thousand followers let's have a cool stream and celebrate like it like kind of make it fun but outside of that yeah. there's just it doesn't like it doesn't really matter too much um and when people come to oh, your sure. channel whether it's from like a raid or something and they follow and then they just never pop up again it, it just becomes almost like a hollow follow so yeah i think yep yeah i think it's really important to find content creators to find streamers to find people who you really just like their content and you really just want to support them just because you like them and what they're doing and you want to help them a little bit and then also just like i think supporting friends i think it's definitely a big difference between follow for follow maybe somebody you just met and you just want them for the follow or whatever versus like if you have a long time viewer a long time friend and they're like hey guess what i started streaming that's an absolute follow i'm going to i can't wait to see you stream i'm going to be the first one there supporting you um yeah. so yeah i think it's some people might get lost in that that blurred line between follow for follow and just following people they genuinely want to support genuinely want to help um they really really enjoy their content and want to be there for them and we get so lost in this this number we talked about it earlier but just sometimes twitch feels like such a number game it's it's you look on your dashboard and everybody has numbers next to them you go on your profile page it's how many followers you have how many views your video <laughs> got your average view it's it's numbers everywhere and it almost just turns this whole experience into just a numbers game instead of a knowing that there's a human being behind every single one of those names that that also taps into like the numbers rat race thing and I, I'm still trying to find the healthy response to this sort of a thing because I kind of became real jaded with like a lot of uh like I guess that's well sponsorships but like I don't know partnership things or whatever because like it, it seems blatantly obvious that it is all about the numbers with a lot of these situations and I I don't know I'm just kind of not about that but I feel like I've kind of almost swung to the other extreme of just being like ah fuck the whole thing basically <laughs> so. Uh, uh, I don't know, man. I'm trying to find that healthy balance right now, I guess. Like you're like sponsors specifically looking for people with numbers or like, yeah. Cause like, I get it. Like you are looking for like an investment. I mean, even like me, audience. like if somebody came up and we were just like, I don't know where I'd be a little hesitant. So I, I get that. I, I guess I have a hard way of describing it because like, I don't know. I, I guess I'm looking at the situation where it's like, if you if you show a track record of like oh clearly people like are enjoying your stuff and you're like starting to like kind of build up stuff and it seems like someone might be willing to be like oh yeah you know this seems like this is good let's go here but then they get somebody with like a bigger number base and stuff and they just go there immediately when they say that they're not about that that's kind of more of what i'm what i'm meaning yeah so I, I had seen some of that and that just kind of like really, really put a sour taste in my mouth. With us. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of, a lot of those companies are trying to cast like as big a net kind of mentality and, and try to attract as many people. And, and for them, I mean, they, they definitely do look at numbers. So it's essentially like, do I want to invest money, whether that's time or sending free products or giving commission codes and stuff like that do i want to send it to mm -hmm. smaller streamers or partner streamers or like where exactly do i target and honestly a lot of companies that sponsor smaller streamers i, I really think in a sense take advantage of a lot of people because mm -hmm. a, a lot of times smaller streamers you know 10 viewers 20 viewers 30 viewers they really get the sense of like i need to have something on my stream that says sponsored by coffee company or energy drink company or insert whatever and i'll feel validated from it and in actuality 
the the company is just getting like free advertisement with very very little if anything getting actually trickled down to the content creator so it's yeah. but yeah at the same it's weird because like if somebody comes knocking on your door you know do you listen to them do you try to negotiate what negotiating power do you have if you don't have other sponsors and at the same yeah. time it's like how many people want to go down that road versus they just want to stream and just have fun so oh, exactly um, well and with sponsorships i'm I, i'm that's not necessarily the best word because like there's that but then there's also like the like working with like i guess gaming companies where if they're like oh do you want to like promote the game that's right. something that you'd be interested in already anyway that kind of a thing too but right. um but yeah no those are good points and like I, I, there are definitely companies out there that try to take advantage of people who don't know their own worth, that kind of a thing. And being like, oh, if you do this advertising for us and, and, and miss making it like it's a sponsorship, but their sponsorship is you buy the stuff and then advertise it. So like you're not right. actually being sponsored. Uh, <laughs> another one I'd even attach to that would be joining um, joining teams, joining stream oh. teams. Yeah. I, I know that might be controversial for some people, um, but like I, I feel like a lot of times it really seems like Twitch streams primarily are used to help the people who create them. You know, the, the partner streamer who creates their own stream team and I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm mixed on the whole stream teams and everything because like... Same here. Uh, yeah, I mean... I, if I was, I don't know. I don't know. Cause like when I first started, I always wanted to just be like individual, kind of have my own thing going. And I didn't ever want to just be like, I'm in a group per se. I wanted to have the individual freedom to like raid other channels or meet other communities and just kind of chart my own path. Um, and mm -hmm. I have seen, I've seen some stream teams that are really good about just like it's not a problem they're really good at networking with others they're really good at making everyone feel inclusive um and i i will definitely say i'm i'm personally part of like a discord the fireside community discord which is just, which is absolutely fantastic at that it's very welcoming and including to everybody and it just it, it's kind of a struggle when you see other teams not as much like that where it seems very focused mm -hmm. on that very top top person you know um so yeah, yeah. That, that's something i feel like a lot of people need to just keep an eye out for know your self-worth and know that maybe turning down the first sponsorship you get or the first opportunity to join a stream team or just kind of look at it with a very more of a critical eye um mm -hmm. there's a lot of self-worth you have by not putting brands or logos or anything on your on your stream it, it, the more i've always thought you know maybe the more naked the stream is to a sense the more appealing it would be to some because there's there's no branding there there's nothing and it's i don't know it kind of creates more of a a value for sponsorships they're looking at it like i mean there's nothing on there maybe we could be first and you kind of get a little bit more leverage in that sense maybe that's just my mind working though <laughs> That's a good point. I, I kind of always have preferred a more minimalist thing anyway. Maybe, maybe, maybe to my fault. I don't know. <laughs> maybe I should have a little bit more of something <laughs> going there. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, yes, Teams, Teams has always been a, a weird thing for me just because, like, I know some people who are on some stream teams and they seem like pretty decent stream teams and, like, it's, it has been helpful for them. But then there's the things like you were talking about, which, like, border on being a cult as far as like the way it's described like if it's all about the one dear leader at the top i mean how different is that from a cult um so there's that and then also the ones that try to be like extremely controlling about like what you do or like who you go with and that for me is a red flag as soon right. as i see anything that looks like that i'm like nope any potential interest i had is out the window right. at that point right and and I don't know like in the sense i see so i just I, i've seen it so many times where somebody hits partner they immediately start their stream team their stream team and just get people on board with it and not saying there's anything right or wrong about that but it's just it's interesting it's like an interesting part of twitch that mm. i don't really see many partners joining other partners twitch streams it's like once they hit partner they ask all of their affiliate friends to join their team and it's 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 interesting um again not saying right or wrong it's just it's it's interesting to observe the the twitch meta kind of unfolding out if you will 
Though I do also wonder how much of that is because of the nature of the Twitch team things itself, because by default, unless something's changed here recently, only partners can make Twitch teams. Right, right. So so that could be something too, where someone's like, oh, well, I want some of my people who are affiliates to have a chance to be in the team and they can't make their own team. So right. there could be that too. I don't know. It's definitely not always the case as 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 you know the horror stories show that that's you know there, there's some situations that aren't that great but it is a shame too just because like there are th there's one organization in particular that i was um that's like um has a mental health focus like with what they do and they do good work and i was really wanting to like look into their program of being like um part of their thing or something like that but then one of the clauses they had in their terms i was just like oh man that is like ripe for abuse because basically it was like oh if um if, if they deem that you're no longer fit for this sort of a thing they can just make a decision to like you know yeah, out and you have no recourse at all whatsoever so it's like oh so if somebody just happens to you know end up not liking me for whatever reason let's just say and maybe they decide to like you know use their power to make that sort of a process happen i there's no safeguard against that at all whatsoever because the way i'm understanding the terms that's what it sounded like so when i read that i was like well, I would like to have done this, but uh, yeah, I do not like any system that has the potential for abuse in there and no check against that at all whatsoever. If only Which we made could, me sad. If only we could be that thorough when we sign up for social media apps and everything that's free and you just scroll to the bottom. Yep, I read all of that and sell all my God. data. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other thing, yeah. It is, it is. Um, one question I absolutely do love to ask though, and hear everybody's opinions is, is what is one thing that you have absolutely grown to love about streaming on Twitch? Uh, I think just the aspect of, um, the connection with people. I mean, I figured I was going to like that anyway, but like, especially doing it, like just, I don't know. I, I guess a good way to describe it is like, I fared pretty well overall during the whole COVID quarantine, quarantine like pandemic thing. Now, part of that was because I basically was a hermit in training for like a year unintentionally prior to that. So for like half a year, so I was kind of conditioned for it already. Uh, and then also being an introvert. But uh, I, I think I would not have fared as well if it wasn't for for streaming. That that social interaction that happened there really, really did help. Um, so yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I've met some wonderful people via streaming, whether it's connecting on Twitter or Twitch, like, you know, us coming together for our shared love of Barrett as he is in FF7 Remake. Yes, yes. Still so <laughs> and, salty John Bentley didn't get a nomination for best voice acting. It is acting. criminal. <laughs> it is criminal. Every time I hear Barrett speak, I'm just like, it's like butter to my ears. He just he knocked it maybe, out apart. Not that I didn't like Barrett's character before, but he literally is the reason why Barrett's one of my favorites. From like just the way that he did it was just it was perfect. And then to boot, uh, unrelated, but Aerith, the character on there, mm -hmm. I was a Tifa man. Like yeah, from FF Seven. Um, I just Aerith's character. Like I get certain things were happening, but there was just certain aspects that just didn't jive that well with me. FF7 Remake, they did Aerith so good in that, that Aerith has dethroned Tifa for me on, on like being the best. I never thought I would say that. Never, yeah. ever did I <laughs> ever think that was going to come out of my mouth. But here we are. I mean, Aerith, they, that's just something I loved so much about Remake was they took these characters that had dialogue, but like not much dialogue just kind of sentences and gave them paragraphs you know um and yeah just that was my favorite part of final fantasy 7 remake was seeing these characters really brought to life and i think they did everyone super good um i think cloud like i always thought cloud was more of just like a loner kind of keeps to himself mentality but playing and i've played final fantasy 7 like 50 plus times i swear i've played that's the most played game i've ever played in my life and i just always thought cloud was more of that loner spirit but playing through remake they really brought him out as more of a uh kind of like a jackass cocky guy like very kind of like he's just so self stuck up on him like i'm a soldier i'm a badass and you know i'm kind of mentality and 
I, playing through it, I was like, I don't know if I ever saw it quite like this, but I now I can totally see it. And going back and playing original seven, I'm like, I can see that. He, he what I was taking for leave me alone kind of loner spirit is just more of like I'm better than you kind of spirit, which a badass, yeah. He is, I mean, he is the a badass. Vocals, <laughs> the vocal stuff and facial expressions, they really do wonders with uh context and help and understand it. They do. I just God, Aerith is just perfect in, 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 in every way in that game, except for the mm, the wisps, the the the, the freaking ghost Whispers. things. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, my God. That last bit. I was. Oh, I was yeah. about to have an aneurysm by the end. of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know. I feel like I, I've played through Final Fantasy seven remake. I'm actually playing it offline. It's like my offline game right now. And I'm nice. almost going to finish it for the third time. I'm like right at the end of it. And every okay. time I've played through it, I just feel more and more mixed. Like the things I love, I just love even more. And the things I'm mixed on, I'm like, why did they do this? And then there's things I'm just like, I really don't like. Like, honestly, like the whispers. I think the whole meta of it, the idea of it, the fate, this like repeating cycle of this world going over and over and over again and Sephiroth somehow out of it and trying to plant seeds that will change the course of it and these whispers are supposed to be meta and keep the storyline intact like i'm kind of cool with that if they just would have implemented it differently i just think the yeah. whole whispers dementor looking thing just didn't do it like keep the concept but just try to display it in a different way that's that's kind of where i ended up as well because i did like some of that stuff i thought that was interesting it, it's just some of the stuff i don't know if i was just stupid at that point in time but like some of the things the earth was saying made no damn sense i'm like how would you have come to this conclusion based on what you know right now or like the one thing where she mentioned about like sephiroth sounds like he'd be a protector of the planet i'm like when did he ever sound like that in the original game like even from the get-go he was talking about oh this I take the planet back from you you know, worthless cretins basically is like his, his mindset so like from the get-go i'm like how does that equate to protector of the planet where where did that come from do you want me to kind of give you like an idea or, or something to think about i've told this to a couple people and and it's people have kind of had a what moment okay all right all right um, Lay it on. spoilers big time for anybody that has not played final fantasy 7 remake so just a heads up um oh shit we but, already kind of <laughs> but I am very much under the impression the more I read through everything and think about it, I think this is a sequel to Final Fantasy VII Advent Children in the sense that the game of... When you think about in a very weird out of it meta percep perception, when you play a game and just play through the whole game, credits end and you repeat it over and over, it's this never ending life cycle in this game of just the story <laughs> being told the exact same way. and that's that's a big theme in final fantasy 7 is the life stream that people are born people die they return to the life stream they become this ever evolving reincarnation is a big theme throughout the game and so my big theory is that um sephiroth and Aerith both together were in the life stream together and they're the ones who know what's going on and they know that this this video game called final fantasy 7 has restarted again the story is going to unfold out but now there's this other Sephiroth who is popping in at points he shouldn't be and interfering with things he shouldn't be and doing certain things that is not the story of Final Fantasy VII. And that's where these whispers are coming in to be like, no, 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 what you, why are you stabbing Barrett? You're not supposed to do that. And bringing Barrett back to life, stuff like that. Um, because there is another Sephiroth. This is the advent children after the whole meteor thing happened like this is a, a sequel to final fantasy 7 more than it is an actual remake see now that's one thing i was wondering about with with Aerith because that was what i originally was thinking it was that she was just as in on it as like sephiroth but then there's certain things that happened like towards the end that made it seem like she was more of like gleaning information from like the contact with the whispers but then she said something about like losing herself every time they like contact her so i I, I don't know as far as that goes, um, but that's 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 interesting that you said that just because that was something I was wondering was that Aerith, she definitely knows more than what she let on, but I was originally thinking that she knew like everything, that it was like the Aerith from there and like the consciousness somehow went back or something like that. And then I wasn't so sure about that afterwards, but jokingly, I had to say, so Zef. Yeah. You're saying that, that um, FF7 is the Dark Souls of Final Fantasy? 
I mean, maybe. I mean, really, <laughs> really, maybe. Um, <laughs> because I mean, of the trap and the cycle and stuff. I just, I had to be stupid. I'm right, sorry. No, no, I was, no. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe. I like, I, when you play through it for a second time or a third time, whenever you go back and replay it, if you have in your head that Sephiroth and Aerith are the two characters that know everything and everything else is playing like it's normal Cloud, normal Tifa and Barrett, like everything else is normal in the world, but Aerith mm. and Sephiroth are different. Like they know something, they know more information than they really should. And I mean, you see it right at the beginning of the game, like where Aerith stands up and she notices something is off and she like starts running out of the, the like hallway or, or whatever, wherever she mm. was. Um, because that's Sephiroth coming to Midgard, like Advent Children Sephiroth, he's he's already lay, layering things in to change the story. I think what's going to happen is, if my in my opinion, I think what's going to happen is Sephiroth is going to lay these little seeds throughout the entirety of the storyline to try to subtly change things. So at the end of the game, Holy does not come out and he ends up like actually completing his plan. Um, and maybe yeah. through that, it's going to be where people try to save Aerith. And I, I, I hope there's not an option to save Aerith. I think it's very important to the story and very important to her character that what happens to her does happen. Maybe it'll be in a different way because these kind of crumbs have been moving all the characters and different things through Sephiroth. He's like kind of changing subtle things, kind of like when you drop a rock in a pond and there's like small waves and they kind of keep going and going. I think maybe she'll die in a different way, but I think it's uh, she will still die. I'm so I'm so torn on it because I agree with the theme thing, but man, they did air so good in this. I just yeah. I don't I don't want baby girl to have that happen to her. But, uh, <laughs> Ima but imagine um, if if she like gets up and walks away, and you think you save her, and you're like, yes, we're gonna save her, and then Sephiroth comes around a corner and something, and just right there. Yeah, like, that's, that's got to be. <laughs> that's got to be something that happens. I, I, that, that's dark. I, I would think anyway. But uh, yeah, the. Um, but yeah, like with Aerith, like even at the beginning, like what you said about like the recontextualizing stuff, like the fact that she says like, ah, oh, this is the flower that's for like lovers that, you know, reunite and stuff like that. It's like she, she's definitely dropping some, letting some right. stuff slip through the cracks she, with right. that, I think. Yeah, because when she goes to Cloud, I mean, if this is a different Aerith, she already knows Cloud and she knows like, hey, I'm or, or she has some kind of hint. So it's. She, yeah, if you if you play through that game, just knowing that Sephiroth and Aerith are like sequel characters, if you will, and everyone mm -hmm. else is normal characters, there's a lot of like aha moments for sure. Yeah. Now, what blows my mind is, is the people that look have, especially the ones that see the scene where it's like Cloud's thing, essentially. You know how there's like Cloud and Barrett and Cloud and Tifa and then Cloud and like Aerith, Aerith and the dream thing. How they see that and come to the conclusion that Cloud doesn't like, isn't in love with Aerith. I'm like, are are you serious? Did you watch the same thing that we watched right now? Did you see his reaction to what she said about not falling in love with her? Like, how can you come to any other conclusion? I just thought, I don't understand it. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I mean, a big part of why Cloud wanted to join Soldier was to, uh, you know, impress Tifa and. <laughs> Get, get the both? girl nuts that's, that's what I'm saying. Why, Why not, not both? both? <laughs> greedy, greedy. No, nah, man, no. Nah. If, 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 if Aerith and Tifa have a solid love for each other there, I mean, why not, you know? I mean, maybe it's Tifa and Aerith and, and we're all fools over here. Like, <laughs> Cloud's just along for the ride. Yeah, he's just along. He's just, he's the loner. He's just along for it. And he's like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> Ooh. Since you were talking about Final Fantasy VII, real quick, mm -hmm. I know it's getting close to like midnight my time, so we'll have to like wrap it up here. I don't want to hold you up, but um, where do you think episode two will stop? Where do you think they'll put the cutoff? I've thought of two good places. Um, I think the first one is right after Aerith dies in um, uh, in uh, the Forbidden the Forbidden City. I think right after that Genova fight could be a good spot but someone was talking about when you get to the top of the northern crater cloud gives sephiroth the black materia sephiroth summons meteor cloud gets lost in the life stream and it essentially becomes like empire strikes back where it looks mm -hmm. like meteors falling monsters or weapons are rampaging across the entire world um just like all sorts of bad things are going on tifa and barrett wake up and they're about to get executed and then just maybe like credits roll right around that time. I feel like that'd be mm. a really good spot because Cloud is lost. 
weapons are going crazy meteors coming they're about to get executed like everything is bad and i feel like credits rolling right there would be a really good spot now with that though i think getting from calm all the way to that is a lot of content for them to do yeah. um so i i i don't know unless they turn it into like a persona 500 hour playthrough <laughs> um I don't, yeah. I don't know what about you that was my concern as well because like the when i see like the insistence when it has to be three parts i'm like why who, who said right. it had to be three parts um because like you said there I, I think it's a lot of stuff they have to go through and i think they would if they went through that much stuff they would rush it essentially like not not that they would want to do that but i mean basically they would have to rush through the story beat so much that i feel like it would end up being underdeveloped and right. would kind of be antithetical to what they were trying to do in the first one now granted there was a little bit of stuff that they could have trimmed out of the first one there was some stuff that was a little on the padding side but overall it, it was good yeah. to have that stuff fleshed out overall I, I think but so in that spirit i think an interesting way that they could do it is tap now granted they had sephiroth show up so that kind of flies in the face of this philosophy but they could still go on the thing of hey some new people are experiencing this so let's you know be clever about certain things i think a cool way to do it would be since we're starting up in calm and that's where typically cloud goes through the backstory of like what happened at nibelheim they do that whole thing and then they end that right when they walk into nibelheim modern day yeah and be like what well, what the fuck why is this why is nibelheim here it should have been burnt down and then bam just end it right there like that have that be like the mic drop essentially for people who've not experienced this before because they would both it would book end with nibelheim at the beginning and the end that's for that, that episode that's pretty interesting um and then i guess like probably wouldn't have sid as a character and maybe not even vincent so it would kind of give more they seem to like to do this where they give more emphasis to characters um, and kind of save some other ones for later. So you kind of get Red 13 and Yuffie and Kate Sith. And then, yeah, I could save like Vincent and Sid for like the next game. Um, that's a good point. Yeah, that's I, I didn't think about that. I wonder how if they do have Vincent, I wonder how his whole thing is limit break is going to work with him transforming. And oh, there's man, so many questions, so many questions. We could literally I have can do it sick. The what? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I was like, we could literally have an entire podcast just on like Final Fantasy VII <laughs> remake. Oh yeah, talk. for sure. <laughs> um, sorry, what were we gonna say? Oh no, just I, I was like, I hope they do it well again. I, I think they did good with Yuffie, right? Like, I can't play Integrate, so I don't know. I, I'm I, trying to keep myself in the dark about that. I liked it a lot. I thought it was. I mean, it was pretty short in a sense. It was only two chapters, but for what it was, I thought it was fun. And there was some kind of some kind of synergized attack between yuffie and sonon so you could kind of see where maybe they could go with that in the future with more like dual tech kind of ideas maybe cloud Ooh. and tifa and Aerith teaming up and doing like a triple attack or something so i don't know that'd be cool if there's one thing i was really kind of salty about it was it was summons like i i don't like the idea that summon materia these these magical creature god beings were just in a vr simulation that chadley could make like there was some, i mean yeah i don't know that there was just something about that that just like super turned me off but i don't know maybe yuffie will steal all the materia and we'll have to get them all back i don't know that'd be interesting yeah um, oh man chadley god i love chadley <laughs> yeah the, the whole or the whole um like the actuality of who his character really is yeah yeah i never got to like go through the dialogue but i ended up accidentally finding out about that unfortunately but it's, an but android. it's cool I, oh wait maybe i did i don't remember it's been a while there's still some stuff in hard mode i had to wrap up so that's that's why i'm not sure um but chadley did you ever talk to him when cloud was in a dress uh oh yes and he'd be like and he was all like stuttering and and like blushing yeah. and stuff oh my gosh that, that that cracked me up so much i was like we're witnessing chadley's first boner right now that's what probably probably um i do have no, I'm right. sorry. no you're good, you're good. <laughs> um i do have two final questions for you my friend um all right so one of the last two ones is in your own words what does streaming mean to you pilgrim I think streaming means um, 
sharing live experiences with with others and just sharing that connection with others i mean on the gaming side of it you can it, it's kind of like playing games on the couch together and having them watch and like just talking about what's happening but then you also can incorporate you know live music performances for example that sort of a thing uh uh art education like it just all the whole gamut really there's so many things um it's I, i've always thought of like streaming on twitch as like a platform for you to showcase whatever you want to do whether it's playing games music art streams art streams are like my favorite streams i i, I say 10 gajillion times but it's so true there is something so awesome about just going into somebody's stream and watching them create art in front of you with some like good background music just to vibe to i'm a sucker mm -hmm. for art streams um very last question for you my friend where all can right. all of our viewers and listeners connect with you online all right well uh twitch and uh twitter would be the two main places and then uh um I mean, I do have a Discord as well. Uh, we are trying to do some cleanup on there recently. I, in 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 the interest, like when I was making it, in the interest of like trying to have like organization to it, I kind of went a little bit overboard and complicated things. So I'm like trying to simplify it gotcha. back. But uh, I did have a link tree set up, but oh my god, I haven't been on there in so long. Let me let me let me see if I have it up on my Twitter or not. Uh, I can't. I don't think I do. Yeah. I, I, I did, but like it had YouTube and stuff on there, and I, I haven't really done too much with you in the future, <laughs> yeah, right? So. Future. I, I I do, but I haven't really done much there yet. I gotta like establish a workflow or something with it, and I don't know. I feel like I was biting off more than I could chew at that point. I don't know why I'm posting this in the Discord there, because you know my channel. I don't know why I'm doing. <laughs> no, you're totally fine. You're totally fine. So, uh, Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, all the all the good places, right? Yeah, Twitch, Twitch, Twitter, and uh, the, like the Discord. If they wanted to check out the Discord, those are like the three things mainly right now. So, and, and I'll we'll have links to all of those down in the description below, a hundred percent. So you can just click there and just go straight over and give Pilgrim a big follow. Um, thank you all so much for watching and listening to this week's episode of the Zephcast. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. It really does help the channel out a lot. And if you want to see more of your favorite content creators, streamers, and podcasters in the near future, don't forget to subscribe. It's absolutely free to do so. And we'll be having even more exciting content coming up soon. Thank you all again for being here. Zephyr's XP, Wandering Pilgrim, and I will catch you all in the next one. Much love, my friends.